The next item of business is a debate on motion 10851 in the name of Angela Constance on International Women's Day. Can I ask members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion uh, up to 14 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, President Officer. Today is International Women's Day, a global day to celebrate women's achievements uh, and to call for accelerated action towards gender parity. This year's theme is Press for Progress. And of course, 2018 is historically significant too. A hundred years ago, uh, some women got the right to vote and the right to stand for election to Parliament. And it's also Scotland's year of young people, a year when we celebrate young people's achievements and contributions and create new opportunities for them to shine locally, nationally and globally. So on International Women's Day in this Scotland's year of young people, I want to talk about equality from the perspective of young women and girls. What does it feel like a century since some women got the vote to be a girl eh, grown up in Scotland today? And I also want to pay tribute to the young women activists who are taking change into their own hands. They are speaking out against sexual harassment, fighting for equal rights and opportunities, challenging societal norms and saying unequivocally that they want equality for women and girls and that they want it now. Not in another hundred years, they want it now. And on Tuesday, alongside the First Minister and the Minister for Childcare in Early Years and the rest of Cabinet, eh, I was really delighted to meet 14 children and young people from the Children's Parliament and the Scottish Youth Parliament, eh, ranging from the age of eh, 9 to early 20s. And this was the eh, second eh, such Cabinet meeting, an opportunity eh, for our children and young people to raise issues that matter to them, eh, direct to the Scottish Government and a chance for us to really listen, discuss and collectively agree about what we can do about the issues that matter to our children. And equality was right up there as one of the topics eh, that children wanted to raise. And we know that some of the particular aspects of women's inequality that we talk about often the gender pay gap, for one example, have their roots in the early years from the kinds of toys and clothes marketed at girls and boys where something as simple as a colour becomes identified with a gender. Or where the aisles for children's clothes are divided by princesses and heroes and the character traits that are considered appropriate for each gender can carry through to subject choice at school eh, and therefore on to career choices. And every year, the charity Girl Guiding UK does a, a girl's attitude survey, a snapshot of what girl and young women think on a wide range of issues and an insight into the pressures uh, facing uh, young women and girls today. And the impact of gender stereotypes is clear. 56% of 70 to 10 year old girls surveyed thought that boys uh, were better at understanding difficult things and 52% thought that girls were better at doing their chores at home. 47% of girls aged between 11 and 21 had seen stereotypical images of men and women in the media in the week that the survey was carried out and that made them feel less confident. And 37% of girls see gender stereotypes being used on social media uh, each and every day. 84% of girls aged 11 to 21 also said that they expect equal opportunities with men in the future and think that childcare should be shared equally between parents. So there is a strong sense, I think, presiding officer, that young women and girls will not accept gender inequality as inevitable. And last year, the Me Too movement erupted in the aftermath of allegations about the Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. And the hashtag has been used literally millions of times on Twitter by women of all ages and men to share their own experiences of sexual harassment. But the origins of the movement go back further to 1996 when activist Tarana Burke, now a director of the Brooklyn-based organisation Girls for Gender Equity, was a youth camp director and a young girl it confided in her about the sexual abuse she was experiencing. And at that time, Tarana said she didn't feel equipped to help. And this is what Tarana said in describing that experience and her interactions with this young woman. Tarana said, I couldn't help her 
release her shame or impress upon her that nothing had happened to her that was her fault. I could not find the strength to say out loud the words that were ringing in my head over and over again as she tried to tell me what she had endured. I watched her walk away from me as she tried to recapture her secrets, tuck them back into their hiding place, and I watched her put her mask back on and go back into the world like she was all alone, and I couldn't even bring myself to whisper me too. But it is as a result of the young woman's story that Tarana went on to start the, the Me Too movement and to help young women of colour who had survived sexual abuse, assault and exploitation. It is indeed a, an emotive and powerful story. But this is how change is made. And it brings to mind the well-known quote by the American anthropologist Margaret Mead, who said, a small group of thoughtful people could change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. In 2005, seven young friends from Drum Chapel High School in Glasgow started another movement, a movement that the Deputy Presiding Officer will be well aware of. One of their number, 15-year-old Agnesa Marcelli, was dawn raided and detained with her family by UK immigration authorities. Agnesa and her family had been settled in Scotland for five years already. They were seeking asylum, having fled from Kosovo, where their Roma ethnicity had put their lives in danger. Agnesa's friends, some of whom were also seeking asylum and concerned by her sudden disappearance, decided to do something and they set up the Glasgow Girls and started campaigning against Agnesa's uh, deportation and for an end to dawn raids on families with children. They started a petition, they held candlelit vigils to prevent other families from being raided and secured cross-party support from this parliament. And with the support of charities and community groups, they kept the issue firmly on the political agenda until ultimately the UK government announced uh, an end to the detention of children for immigration purposes uh, in 2010. And in September 2008, uh, the Marcelli family were granted indefinite leave to remain. And the story of the Glasgow girls, uh, Amal Azudin, uh, Rosa Sally, Agnesa Marcelli, Yulina Sivak, Tony Lee Henderson, Jennifer McCarran and Emma Clifford has inspired TV documentaries, dramas uh, and even a musical. And of course, there are many more stories and testimonies and experiences like these. 2015 Girls Against was founded by a group of teenage girls in Scotland just fed up at being sexually harassed and assaulted at gigs and live music venues. Now they have thousands of supporters and they work with bands, festivals and venues at uh, the length and breadth of the country. In Kenya, five teenage girls from Kizumo Girls High School had created an app that connects girls affected by female genital mutilation to legal and medical assistance. And it also has a panic button for girls to alert the authorities. Malala Yousafzai, who needs no introduction, a young woman from Pakistan who campaigns for a girl's right uh, to an education, and of course, uh, the youngest Nobel Prize laureate. In England, Amika George, an A-level student, has started a free periods campaign for every student receiving free school meals to receive free sanitary products. More than 80,000 people have added their name to Amika's petition. And I am pleased that in Scotland, we have already committed to fight period poverty by providing access to sanitary products for students in schools, colleges and universities. And we've recently taken the decision to continue providing sanitary products to over 1,000 women who participated in our Aberdeen pilot project uh, while we evaluate the outcomes of that particular project. And I could go on, of course, presiding officer, but the point is, Young women and girls in Scotland, across the UK and around the world are speaking out against social injustice and inequality, just like the suffragettes a hundred years before them. And today, another Scottish woman has been honoured, Mary Barber, for among other things, her pivotal role in leading the revolt against rent increases in Glasgow eh, during the First World War. In 1915, when men at the front line uh, an influx of workers to Glasgow shipyards and munitions factories resulted in overcrowded tenements. And landlords taking advantage of the situation hiked rents up by as much as 23%. By November that year, as many as 20,000 tenants were on rent strike. 
And in his 1936 book, Revolt on the Clyde, the socialist leader, Willie Gallagher, remembers them as Mrs. Barber's army. And he wrote, in Govan, Mrs. Barber, a typical working class housewife, became the leader of a movement such as had never been seen before or since for that matter. Street meetings, back court meetings, drums, bells, trumpets, every method was used to bring the women out. And within a month, Munitions Minister Lloyd George uh, changed the law to reduce rents to pre-war levels across the country. And today, a bronze statue of Mary and her army by sculptor Andrew Brown is being unveiled at Govan Cross in Glasgow. And the methods may have changed. Social media has replaced back court meetings, perhaps. But just like Mary, uh, young women are standing up for what they believe is right. And we need to support, encourage, and above all, listen to what they are telling us. And one of the findings from the Girl Guidance Survey that I mentioned earlier was that 57% of 11 to 21 year old girls surveyed don't think that politicians understand the issues that they face today. And quite simply, that's just not good enough and we should all uh, respond to that loudly and clearly. Which is why meetings, among other things, like uh, the meeting that Cabinet had on Tuesday with the children and young people are so important. The First Minister's uh, National Advisory Council on Women and Girls deliberately has three young women members, 15-year-old uh, Amina Ahmed, 17-year-old Katie Horspra, and 21-year-old Suki Wan. And the second meeting of the Council also took place on Tuesday and focused on attitudes uh, and culture change. Presiding officer, it is in all of our interest to keep pressing for progress towards gender parity because equality for women and girls uh, is good for all of us, it's good for our economy and it's good for our society. That doesn't mean that achieving gender equality is easy, it isn't, but every step forward, every step that takes us closer to that goal is a step worth taking. And I'm proud of the steps that the Scottish Government has taken. Already this year, we've passed legislation on domestic abuse and on women's representation on public boards. Our STEM strategy is prioritising challenging gender stereotypes and encouraging girls to get excited about STEM and the rewards of a career in STEM sectors. On Tuesday, Skills Development Scotland organised an event in Glasgow targeted at young people from underrepresented groups who are interested in finding out more about modern apprenticeships, including young women considering STEM careers, as well as care experienced uh, BME and disabled uh, young people. Equally safe, our strategy to tackle all forms of violence against women and girls sets out our commitment to piloting a whole school approach to tackling gender-based violence in partnership with Zero Tolerance, Rape Crisis Scotland and Education Scotland. These are the, the formative years for young people and we want to ensure that we are helping them to develop a good understanding of what healthy relationships are and about consent. But we can and always and must do more. And today the First Minister announced that she will once again run the First Mentor Initiative, offering another young woman the chance to be mentored by her for a year. She's also called another woman to join her by offering a little bit of their time and their experience to another woman or girl to help them reach their goals and to fulfill their potential. And later this year, in recognition of the centenary of women's suffrage, the Scottish Government will hold an event uh, with young women to talk about what we can do to get more women into political office. So much has changed over the course of a century, uh, much for the better in terms of women's rights and equality, but we need to be absolutely vigilant in terms of the good progress uh, that has been made, and we need to keep taking uh, those steps forward. Uh, so we can and we should all pay tribute and play a part uh, in pressing uh, for progress and never for a minute uh, taking our foot off the pedal. Thank you very much. I now call Annie Wells to speak to and move Amendment 10851.1. Around nine minutes, please, Ms Wells. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> I will try and get through this today. I am grateful to Angela Constance for securing this debate today on what is International Women's Day, a worldwide event aimed at celebrating women's achievements and inspiring people across the world to continue the fight for gender equality. The campaign, which began with a Women's March in New York in 1909, is an opportunity for governments and women's organisations to come together to reaffirm our priorities in achieving true gender parity. Following the events of the past year, where women's rights dominated the news, 
in the wake of a global reckoning and sexual misconduct. It's more important than ever that we avoid complacency and continue in the spirit of this year's theme to press for progress. That is why I will be supporting the Scottish Government's motion today as we seek to protect and promote the fight, the rights of women and girls across the world. Tying in with the centenary of women's rights to vote last month, we have much to celebrate in the way of progress. I look at women and girls of today and see that the choices open to them are far greater than the ones I had. I remember having my careers talk at school and wanting to join the army or the police. Although the reason that I was steered away from this idea was due to my height more than my gender, the alternatives presented to me at the time were either administrative or secretarial roles. I attended a night class for computer programming during my, high, my secondary school, something that was new and exciting for me, but at no point did any of my teachers suggest that this might be a career route. Now fast forward 20 years, and I am greatly pleased to see the emphasis now being placed on improving female uptake of STEM subjects. In my own region, Glasgow, we are lucky enough to have a number of initiatives seeking to promote gender equality in this area. Glasgow Caledonian University, for example, has worked with Smart STEMs to host workshops for school pupils in coding, aviation, and digital modeling, to name a few. And nationally, we have seen the likes of PricewaterhouseCoopers-led Tech She Can Charter, a national commitment by organisations to work together to increase the number of women in tech roles in the UK um, and share best practices. At the moment, just 5% of STEM apprenticeships starts in Scotland are women. And in the UK as a whole, the percentage of women studying STEM degrees make up to just 25% of the total a figure that has been stagnant, stagnant for the past two years. What's required if we are to have a serious impact on these figures? And I welcome the, the efforts by the Scottish Government to improve girls' uptake of STEM subjects. But we also have to ask ourselves as individuals, how are we encouraging the young women and girls in our own lives to consider a career in STEM? In Scotland's Year of the Young People, it's more important than ever that we look at how education and decisions made early in life impact young women for the rest of their lives. And when it comes to women in the workplace, more generally, figures relating to the gender pay gap make for truly uncomfortable reading. Four decades on since the gender pay gap was passed, the UK gender pay gap remains remarkably high. According to the ONS, when all workers are included, the pay gap is 18.4%, meaning that women effectively work for free for six to seven days of the year. In recent months, I am pleased to see that this has been spoken about more and more in the media and that women are becoming increasingly aware and confident in challenging the gulf that exists between male and female pay. As we recently saw with presenters at the BBC, it's absolutely right to challenge the status quo after figures came to light showing that most of the top earners were men, the gender pay gap became an embarrassing shadow it could no longer ignore. Transparency of this is key. By just a few figures being made public, there has been a snowball effect, with pressure now being laid upon the BBC to publish data on the individual salaries of all of its staff. I sincerely hope that the UK government's wider policy on mandatory gender pay gap reporting will have a similar effect, creating a culture whereby companies simply can't afford to tarnish their image in this way. Um, I'd just like to carry on, thank you. In addressing why the gender pay gap exists, we must of course also look at why women are not better represented in the high level executive jobs we associate with high pay and big bonuses. Whilst we may differ at times on solutions, I am sure we can all agree that there are clearly deep-rooted cultural and societal barriers holding women taking top jobs. Culturally, I strongly believe we are still peddling the same gender stereotypes of what we expect from girls and boys as they grow up. Women are still also faced with the overwhelming societal expectation that they should lead in childcare. 
Companies desperately need to incorporate organisational designs that recognise these pressures and bring talented women up through the pipeline. And these companies do exist, as I have said many times with the example of FDM based in Glasgow. We must, as, po as politicians, seek out exemplary businesses and champion them in the way that encourages others. And of course, International Women's Day is not just about the UK. With the World Economic Forum's 2017 Global Gender Gap Report telling us that gender parity is over 200 years away, the well-being and status of women across the world is central to our fight. To put into context, one in three women globally have experienced some form of physical or sexual abuse. One in five girls have, are believed to have been married before the age of 18. And around two thirds of the world's illiterate adults are women. And in developing countries and rural areas, agriculture remains the most important employment sector for women. A sector that largely falls within the informal economy with little or no social protection and labour rights. I am pleased that the UK aid funded programmes are working with organisations across the world to end violence against women and girls and challenge the discriminatory practices that hold women back in family life, education and their working lives. We must also strive to do more, creating a life for millions of women where they don't feel discriminated against or in danger or still missing out on their desired opportunities should be a name that transcends this chamber and beyond. To finish the day, Deputy President Officer, it wouldn't be right of me to not wish everyone a happy International Women's Day, but also to wish the same to my mum, who's an inspiration to me. Um, and I would have got it in the neck if I hadn't mentioned her. <laughs> as elected representatives, I believe we all have a duty to work together as a parliament and indeed in countries across the world to do more to achieve full equality for women. We sense the tide is turning, but we should never be complacent we are 200 years away from achieving gender equality, and that is 200 years too long. I move the amendment in my name. <clears throat> I call Rhoda Grant to speak to and move amendment 10851.2 for around seven minutes, please, Ms. Grant. Um, thank you, presiding officer, and I move the amendment in my name. I wish that my role as woman and equality spokesperson didn't need to exist. And I also wish that International Women's Day didn't need to exist. But after 100 years from, since the first woman in this country was allowed to vote, and 109 years since the first International Women's Day, there are still many battles that we need to be won. The, the theme of this year's International Women's Day is press for progress, and that's the reasoning behind our amendment. While the government this motion talks about progress made, our amendment keeps pressing for progress. And I think that creates the right balance. My colleague Monica Lennon will take the opportunity to speak about her campaign to stop period of poverty when she winds up the debate. Again, it's an issue that has been long overlooked, but it, it has become a real difficulty in these times of austerity. Low pay and access to benefits makes sanitary products unaffordable and therefore keeps women and girls out of education and out of the workplace. This is an issue that has gained support throughout the chamber. So we need to continue to press for progress. The support is there. We need to make the progress. Every year on International Women's Day, there are celebrations and events all over the country and all over the world. And while it's great to see many male feminists acknowledging and thanking women for their contribution to society, it still remains that the best way to really thank women is to treat them with respect and treat them as fellow human beings deserving equality. There are many inherent issues that are holding women back from fulfilling their potential. Violence, abuse, sexual harassment are seen as women's issues, even though the perpetrators are usually men. So therefore, it is a man's problem. Inequality in terms of pay and representation prevent women from reaching their economic possibilities, as well as having the political power to change the system, which is already stacked against them. And when you add to all of that any of the protected characteristics, then women fare even worse. Women with disabilities, black and ethnic minority women and lesbians 
all face greater challenges and greater inequalities. We need to press for progress against violence against women. This Parliament has passed legislation criminalising psychological gender-based violence, something I believe that many of our early members could only dream of, but now we've achieved that. It'll be difficult to prosecute, but we must keep evaluating the impact and making sure that the police and the prosecution services have the knowledge and training to do this. Without adequate training, perpetrators will get away, victims will not get justice as we have all seen with regard to revenge porn. Just this week, it was revealed that more than 60% of cases under the new revenge porn legislation reported to the police have not been passed to prosecutors. We need better justice for victims. Therefore, even with some successes, we, which we all celebrate, there is still very much more to do. We have women suffering violence, and we need to strengthen the support services that help them rebuild their lives. We have a huge gap between the criminal law and family law. A criminal court convicts someone of domestic abuse, yet the civil court often grants that same person access to their children and thereby to their abused partner. The abuser has access to all his victims to continue that abuse. How can the courts be so ignorant of the damage that this does to a child and the abused partner? The child is damaged by the abuse, their self-esteem is affected, their sense of safety and resilience is undermined, and this damage can last a lifetime and have a serious impact on their future. Yet we have courts that facilitate that abuse on behalf of the state, and how wrong is that? We really need to introduce, as a matter of urgency, legislation that protects children. We need domestic abuse courts throughout the country staffed by suitably trained <coughs> staff. The fiscals and sheriffs need to know what they're dealing with and have a true understanding of the crime. These same courts need to deal with family law issues arriving out of the, arising out of those cases such as custody and access and divorce. This also highlights the need for split payments. Richard Leonard at First Minister's Questions raised this issue. Domestic abuse starts with financial abuse. Women need to be able to have financial independence and the government must look at their stance on this and change it at stage three to give women the protection they need. We need to press for progress on sexual exploitation to free women from this damaging practice which increases which is increasing in our society rather than decreasing. If we want to see true equality, women cannot and should not be commodities to be bought and sold in Scotland because this de demeans all women. Sexual exploitation creates an atmosphere of entitlement in men and therefore encourages sexual violence. Respect within relationship is not taught to young people at home or in school. They learn much of their sex education from extreme pornography, which also leads to an increase in sexual violence. How can you be equal if you do not command the same respect as someone of the opposite sex? Recently, the High Court ruled that women who had been forced into prostitution and criminalised as a result should not have to reveal these convictions. And while this ruling is a step in the right direction, it seems very odd to me that they can still be convicted but that it is against their human rights to be forced to reveal these convictions. Can I ask the Scottish Government what the steps they are taking with regard to this ruling and whether it will lead to changes in our legislation here in Scotland? It's simply wrong that women are criminalised and the men who have abused them get off scot-free. Fiona Broadfoot, one of the women who took the case, said, not one of those men who bought and used and abused me even the ones that knew fine well I was a child when I was first put on the streets has ever had to face the consequences of his actions. It's time for change and we need to press for progress. So while we take pride of all the advances made, we recognise that we're still a long way off from true equality. On International Women's Day, we need to redouble our efforts. We need to press for progress and we need to make progress. I hope in my lifetime, these debates will no longer exist. And I hope in my lifetime that women will be truly equal. Now move to the open debate. And it's speeches of six minutes. However, I do, I do have quite a bit of time in hand. So there's room to be flexible in terms of interventions and giving time back. Um, can I call, please, Gail Ross to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. <coughs> 
Thank you, President Officer. Today is International Women's Day, and someone who shall remain nameless said to me earlier on, when's International Men's Day? And that reminded me of when I was younger, on Mother's Day, when I rather petulantly, petulantly asked my mum, when is Daughter's Day? And her response, every day is Daughter's Day. International Women's Day is a celebration held across the world to mark the economic, political and social achievements of women past, present and future. In 1908, 15,000 women marched through the streets of New York demanding better pay, working hours and the right to vote. In 1910, at the International Conference of Working Women in Copenhagen, a vote was passed that proposed in every country on the same day a National Day of Women would be held to highlight inequality wherever it was found, whether in the home or at work, and to press the need for change. In 1911, the day was held in a number of European countries on March the 19th, and it wasn't until 1913 that an internationally agreed date of March the 8th was agreed. By that time, millions of women across the globe had become aware of the need to highlight terrible working conditions, the complete absence of any legislative employment protections, and provided a platform for social justice. In 1975, the United Nations announced the International Women's Year. Before 1975, most married women could only get credit if a man guaranteed their loan. Girls were not allowed to play rugby and football at school, and many schools taught different subjects to boys and girls. Presiding officer, that was only two years before I was born. In 1999, the STUC put forward a women's agenda for the Scottish Parliament, including championing family-friendly policies, equal pay, and tackling bullying and harassment, extending the provision of flexible, accessible, and affordable childcare, embracing the principles of lifelong learning, and ensuring women are properly represented within the parliament itself at all levels of policy and decision making. Presiding officer, how far we have come. We have already passed some groundbreaking legislation in this parliamentary term that will undoubtedly help women. But it's not just legislation that we pass in this chamber that has an effect on how we see and treat women, because as far as we have come, we still have much to do. Some of the attitudes that still exist in society today find an outlet in the remarks, insults, and sometimes even threats aimed at female politicians. Every day, correspondence to my office can and does include language and comments that would never be included in correspondence to a man, and I know this because I used to work for a male MSP. We see much worse online. Comments on everything from appearance to sexuality, people typing whatever comes into their head without consideration of the consequences. It's not true that once you become elected, you become some political robot. We're still human beings with feelings and families. And we can't pretend that the results from the recent sexual harassment survey conducted here in this very building is anything but highly alarming. But it's International Women's Day, so I want to take a minute to talk about one inspirational woman from international politics. Any female politician, or to be honest, any female, that hasn't read Hillary Clinton's book, What Happened, should do so immediately. Whether you agree with her politics or not, she gives a great insight into the way she was treated during the presidential election campaign. And I was struck by a paragraph where she talks about some advice she received about being a female politician. Women are seen favorably when they advocate for others, but unfavorably when they advocate for themselves. For example, there's virtually no downside to asking for a raise if you're a man. You'll either get it or you won't, but you won't be penalized for trying. A woman who does the same is much more likely to pay a price. Even if she gets a salary bump, she'll lose a measure of goodwill. The exception is when a woman asks for a raise on someone else's behalf. Then she's seen as generous and a team player. You have a steep mountain to climb. They will have no empathy for you. And to move on to science, we all know the name Marie Curie, the first person to win two Nobel Prizes. But how many people know that she was actually prevented from joining France's Academy of Science because she was a woman? Rosalind Franklin played a huge part in decoding the structure of DNA but three men claimed the Nobel Prize for her discovery. Astrophysicist Jocelyn Bell Burnell discovered pulsars. Her male supervisor claimed the Nobel Prize. 
Lee's Meitner was pivotal in the discovery of nuclear fission, but not only did she fail to get the Nobel Prize, she wasn't even allowed on the floor where the male scientists worked. Again, we've come so far, but we still have more to do. Presiding officer, we see so much lip service paid to women's rights. Warm words on social media, good intentions outlined in press releases, but words are no substitute for deeds. Action is required, and not just a crowd-pleasing box-ticking exercise. We need to adopt a zero-tolerance approach to sexual harassment and abuse, a zero-tolerance approach to gender-based violence, to female genital mutilation, to the belittling sexist, misogynist language, judging women on their appearance, saying that 50-50 quotas prevent women taking positions on merit. Women have the merit. Quotas merely give them the opportunities. A zero-tolerance approach to being treated like second-class citizens, like we should still be chained to the sink, barefoot and pregnant, this year will prove to be pivotal in the fight for women's rights, equality and respect. We won't settle for being paid less than men. We won't settle for being asked in an interview if we're planning to start a family. We're here to contribute, to challenge and to compete. So let's celebrate the women, all the women, I'll celebrate my mum, my sisters, my aunties, my nieces, my cousins, my friends, my sisters in this chamber and my sisters around the world. And I will bring up my own son to celebrate and respect women. Presiding officer, women are looking for us here to set not just laws, but an example. So let's make sure first and foremost that this parliament can be held up as a place where women feel safe, valued and appreciated. Let's make sure that every day is Women's Day. Call Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this International Women's Day debate. There are many topics which could be covered today. The gender pay gap, childcare provision, sexual harassment, violence and abuse against women domestically and in war zones, and equal representation, to name a few. However, I'd like to focus on the legal profession and to look at the number of young girls choosing to study law, the opportunities that they and women have within the profession, and in particular, to assess the progress which has been made in this currently male-dominated profession. Here, interestingly, according to the latest statistics available from SPICE, in 2015-16, of the Students graduating with a law degree in Scotland, 63.5% were female and 36.5% were male. In the same year, of those con completing the Diploma in Professional Legal Practice, required after the LLB degree to become a solicitor, 66.1% were female compared to 33.9% male. And since 2012, According to the Law Society, more women have completed legal traineeships than men. In 2016-17, this equates to 322 women to 173 men. Thereafter, as the next career stages progress, it becomes evident that the higher percentages of women to men starts to decline. So in 2015, there were marginally more fully qualified female lawyers holding practicing um, certificates than male. However, in terms of women reaching the top of the legal profession during the last decade, Scotland can be proud, proud of some exceptional women who have provided hugely encouraging examples of how women can lead the way for the younger intake of female lawyers. Scotland's first female Lord Advocate, the head of the Criminal Prosecution Service in Scotland, Dame Ailish Angelini, was appointed in 2006 and held the post until 2011. And whilst the head of the judiciary in Scotland, the Lord President of the Court of Session and Lord Justice General has never been a woman, the Lord Justice Clark, Scotland's second most senior judge, is, the very, is for the very first time a woman, Lady Dorian. Father Moon. Yes, certainly. John Mason. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving away. I'm fascinated by her uh, 
th progression of this, I'm not sure where she's going, but in, we looked at the gender pay gap on the Economy Committee. Does she think it's just a matter of time till women take up more senior positions, or do we need to do something positive to move that forward? I, I Margaret hope to develop Mitchell. that theme, but my, my point is that just now there are many more young girls qualifying in law, so I would expect to see um, a corresponding increase in them fulfilling these places. And as we go on, I hope to, to tell you what I think needs to happen to try and encourage that. Um, furthermore, of the current 35 senators of the College of Justice in Scotland who sit in the Court of Session in the High Court, 10 are women. At sheriff court level, however, the numbers are less encouraging. Of the 142 permanent or resident sheriffs sitting in our 39 sheriff courts, only 27 are women. At a UK level, the Supreme Court is led by the Baroness Hale of Richmond, the first ever female head of the judiciary in the United Kingdom. She was also the first woman law lord in 2004 and then the first woman justice of the Supreme Court in 2009. However, not of the 11 other members of the Supreme Court, only one other justice, Lady Black of Derwent, is a woman. And at a European level, the European Parliament conducted a study of the legal profession across EU countries in August 2017. This revealed that women predominate in practice areas such as family and child law, and that their presence in commercial law practice areas is increasing. This trend has been reflected in an increase in the number of female partners in large pan European law firms. Significantly, the reason given for this change is that commercial practice is becoming more about negotiation and client care than about contentious lit litigation. And that this in turn has seen an increased requirement for skills that are, and I quote, seen as the, those stereotypically possessed by women. This European study was also, found, also found that although there is an increase in females entering the legal profession and becoming partners, the numbers of women progressing to partnership or to elite levels in the advocacy pr profession is still very small. In conclusion, presiding officer, Scotland has much to be proud of and there has undoubtedly been a significant increase in the number of women entering the legal profession. But equally, with some notable, notable exceptions, there is still a steep hill to climb before this trend is reflected at the top of the law profession in years to come. And I hope that by raising awareness about stereotypes and by addressing the wider societal issues such as adequate childcare provision and the presumption as to who bears the burden of caring for children or other dependents, that a level playing field can be achieved in providing all women with the opportunities to reach the top of the legal profession. In the meantime, we recognise and pay tribute to trailblazers such as Lady Hill and Dame Angelini for the, break the breakthroughs they made that will pave the way for future generations of women. I call Christina McKelvey to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And it's a good place to start where Margaret Mitchell has just uh, finished off because gender parity is at least 200 years away, says the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report. Even slaves didn't wait that long to have their freedom respected. And while we know that gender parity won't happen overnight, or even maybe in three centuries, the good news is across the world, women are making positive gains day by day. Plus, there's indeed a very strong and, and growing global movement of advocacy, activism and support. So we in Scotland won't let up. Now more than ever, there's a strong call to action to push forward and progress gender parity. A strong call to progress, to press for progress. A strong call to motivate and unite friends, colleagues and whole communities to think, act and be gender inclusive. And the Press for Progress campaign has five asks and they are maintain a gender parity mindset, challenge stereotypes and bias, 
forge positive visibility of women, you're doing very well today, girls, influence others' beliefs and actions, and celebrate women's achievements. And my, have we got a lot to celebrate. And every one of us in this chamber has a responsibility, regardless of your gender, to actively support equality and fairness in all of its facets. And, presiding officer, I've said in this chamber before that men of quality should never fear equality. And that's a good statement for today. We have legislation, commissions, equal rights and legal protection provided by ECHR and European law, reinforced by our own laws around fairness and equality for all people. We have had some major victories, hard and well won, against employers who have underpaid female staff for decades. Which is why today is a great day for saying, no, we won't sit quietly and accept the status quo. We will fight it all the time and we will fight it hard until the need for fighting has gone because inequality will have then have gone. We need to press still harder for progress to risk irritating some angry men and perhaps most important of all stop seeing ourselves as the second-rate humans some members of society seem to feel is appropriate to call us. Women of every age, background, ethnicity, religion, prosperous or not, are already engaged in this process. What we all want and what Scotland is determined to win is quite simple, to be treated equally. It's not that difficult. And if you look at some of the international examples of that, take the Mizuzu Coffee Planters Cooperative Union, for instance. They grow and trade in coffee beans in Malawi. Those coffee beans were originally transported via Zanzibar from the Edinburgh Botanic Gardens. So we have a link to that coffee that's grown in Malawi. And the other night, I met with Bernard Kounda, who's the general manager of the Mizuzu Coffee Planter Cooperative Union and at the Hamilton Fair Trade Group meeting. And he informed me of a great success of a gendered aspect of the work that they do with women. It includes coffee beans produced by women being sold with a 20 cents premium added. This 20 cents is saved and distributed to women in a microfinancing model to build business and grow local economies. It's been incredibly successful and has resulted in many new women entrepreneurs and businesses developing in Malawi all from a coffee bean from Edinburgh. So let's take this a bit more locally too. Jigsaw Travel and Wellhall Road in Hamilton was founded in 1998 by Leslie Miller. The business is a corporate bespoke travel company specialising in complex, personalised travel bookings. This company is the winner of the Scottish Passenger Agents Association Best Small Business Travel Agent Award in 2017 and 2016 and has been nominated for several Glasgow Business Awards and Lanarkshire Business Awards. They have clients from all over the UK, so what was a local business like that coffee bean has now grown to have a very strong national base. And the Federation of Small Business has nominated Leslie as one of the top 100 businesswomen in the UK, a super accolade for Leslie and her team. The business has now grown to employ seven members of staff, all of them women. And I'm sure you will agree with me, presiding officer, that to have such a thriving business within my constituency highlighted today of all days is incredibly appropriate. These are all great successes, but we have so much more to do. And even in our government structures, we have work to do. In Yarlswood Detention Centre today, presiding officer, 100 women, 120 women, sorry, are on hunger strike. A centre described by the inspector of prisons as a place of national concern. The organisers of the protest that they're holding today outside Yarlswood is, uh, tell us that the strike is a refusal to submit to institutionally racist detention conditions, which is an integral part of the hostile environment policy currently enforced by the UK government. A sad indictment. The Home Office wrote to these women on Saturday, the hunger strikers, threatening to expedite their extradition and refusing to listen to their demands. Some of these women are experiencing horrific conditions within Yarlswood, including, in some cases, sexual assault. I stand with these women today and I ask my colleagues in this chamber to do the same and send that message of solidarity. And last year, presiding officer, the Pussy Hat Revolution, resulting in me getting a row from the presiding officer for donning my fetching pink hat. I won't be doing that this year, presiding officer, but the message is still absolutely clear. She's got her evil eye on. 
A small push maybe against the establishment, but every act of pressing for progress takes us closer to that more equal world we all wish to live in. Just like those suffragists 100 years ago with their good cause, we have many good causes and we've heard of them today. One like Press for Change, the other like Me Too and Time's Up, a campaign which tells the misogynists that the clock has run out on sexual assault, harassment and inequality in the workplace. So time's up for misogyny, time's up for harassment, time's up for unequal pay, time's up for inequality. Presiding officer, time's up is not a slogan, it's a directive. So I ask you, my colleagues here today, what will you do to press for progress? Uh, can I remind everyone, still do have a bit of time in hand if um, people feel the urge to make interventions. And I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And today on International Women's Day, may I say that it's great to see a woman um, presiding over us. <laughs> um, history, though, is written by the winners. For as long as we have been living in a patriarchal society, the winners have been men. In a room of one's own, Virginia Woolf wrote, the majority of women are neither harlots nor courtesans, which I heartily agree with, <laughs> nor do they sit clasping pug dogs to dusty velvet all through a summer afternoon. But what do they do? All the dinners are cooked, the plates and cups washed, the children sent to school and gone out into the world. No biography or history has a word to say about it. However, when Oscar winner Frances McDormand invited women to stand up and be visible because their stories should be told, it made me think of my countless sisters who have been invisible in Scotland and across the world. And International Women's Day is here to celebrate and create a space for women where our stories should and must be told. Today, to misquote Rapport, we celebrate her history. Her story, rather, sorry. The fight for women's equality is intertwined with the history of the labor movement. Working class women like Selena, Selena Miller, a suffragist and mill worker from the north of England, put it best when she said, women did not want the vote as a mere plaything, but, I quote, every woman is longing for her political freedom in order to make the lot of the worker pleasanter and to bring about reforms. Emmeline Pankhurst, as one of the founding members of the Labour Party, a movement agree which agreed with her when she said she hoped our movement might be the means of righting every political and social wrong. Of course it isn't. It's across the parties and those in no party at all who do this. But I am proud of the Labour movement history. And as the Cabinet Secretary said today, uh, there are MSPs today who are going to commemorate Mary Barber with the unveiling of her statue in Glasgow as Glasgow's first Scottish female councillor who also led the, the South Govan Women's Housing Association during the Glasgow rent strikes of 1915, actively organising tenant committees and eviction resistance, which can't have been easy. Women here in Scotland and across the world have always stood up for the rights of others, writing themselves into history in the process. Ida B. Wells, one of my mother's countrywomen, was one of the first ever investigative journalists in the USA. She wrote about and led an anti-lynching crusade in the United States in the 1890s, traveling as a black woman to the southern states, a hugely dangerous undertaking, while Jim, Jim Crow laws were in full force. From Austin to Bronte, from Bronte to Elliot, from Eliot to Angelou and Sarah Waters, women's writing is seen as the very best in our literary history. Why then, after a hundred years, is it that Ida B. Wells is still in the minority of women journalists? She broke the ground and her, vo and her voice and work has echoes in today's Zero Tolerance Right to End Violence Awards, which happen every year here in our parliament and which drives up standards in journalism by rewarding those committed to further to the cause of gender equality through their work. However, Zero Tolerance yesterday, whose 25th anniversary we celebrate this year, reminded us that the portrayal of women and girls in the media 
has direct influence on people's attitudes and behaviour. While we all know this, media monitoring by the charity shows that a skewed and dangerous perspective of nine major newspapers expose people to the wrong sort of language, and language matters. And it's distressing that this year major newspapers are still reporting such grievous crimes as rape and sexual assault as sex, failing to set the story and the scale and the context of violence against women and giving sensationalised and graphic descriptions. Part of the solution, of course, is the employment of more women journalists. However, whatever our gender, there is a collective responsibility to speak in the right language. And I'm pleased that at the last awards, which many of us here today attended, uh, the NUJ Scotland highlighted this importance <coughs> and supported the awards. I spoke of Virginia Woolf at the beginning of this short speech. She discussed what it would take to have more female writers. She said, a room of one's own and 500 pounds a year. Perhaps that's gone up a bit now, but anyway. <laughs> In doing so, she summed up that women will only achieve equality through economic independence. It was a Labour government that put uh, the, her words into law in the Equal Pay Act of the 1970s. But as others have highlighted, we are nowhere near where we should be with that still. The fight has not ended by any means. And we as a parliament do have the power, as highlighted by both Rhoda, my, my friend and colleague, and by Richard Leonard today, to, have, to help some of the most marginalised women in Scotland uh, through economic agency, requiring ministers to bring forward regulations that will ensure that the payments of universal credit are automatically split between both members of a couple. This would, I think, be particularly helpful to women in an abusive relationship and give fin financial empowerment. As, yes, I will. Angela Constance. I, I'm very grateful to Ms Beamish giving away in what is a hugely important and sensitive matter and I do think we are uh, at one um, on this. Um, I think the point that the First Minister was making uh, this afternoon is that while we are supportive and indeed we are of split payments, actually we rely on getting the agreement of the DWP to do it and then we would have to pay them. But I do hope um, members uh, across the benches can encourage their colleagues in the Houses of Commons to support Philippa Whitford's Members' Bill, where we could deal with this very issue at source, and actually for all women across the UK. Claudia Beamish. I welcome that intervention because I think uh, part of the issue is that um, good women and good men work together um, across this chamber and beyond, and on a global basis on these issues. I, I'm sure that we will reach, reach a resolution on it. We must. As Virginia Woolf said, the experience of the mass is behind a single voice. It may not seem like a great act in history to do this together. It's just a small change, but many such small changes made by women to ensure our safety and economic equality have turned our fine words on International Women's Day year after year into tangible actions. So let's do this and so much more together. Thank you. Gillian Martin, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, my speech today should have been the easiest to write because my speech last year was one of the easiest I've ever written but this year and this week it wasn't. I was going to use my whole six minutes talking about my project to map a tourist trail around Scotland recognising the women who've shaped Scotland and I will get on to that but I just couldn't stand up today and not talk about the continued and distressingly all too close to home subject of sexual harassment of women. I am all for free speech, but I find myself wanting to erase phrases from our discourse around the rights women have to feel safe, unimpeded and respected in the workplace in particular. One such phrase is, it's only banter. Well, maybe to the person delivering it who thinks he's been the most hilarious man on the planet, yes it is, but to the woman on the receiving end who's too polite to say what she really thinks or feels that to speak vociferously would put her at risk, no, it's not banter. They are words that diminish, control, objectify, insult, embarrass, and distress. Outright abuse, obvious, unwanted physical contact is horrific, but it is not the only type of abuse. Insidious, sustained, thinly veiled sexual comments are not uh, to be ignored, and they have a pernicious and cumulative effect. You worry you'll not be believed. 
You know you'll be told you're overreacting. You know people will question your complaint's validity. You'll find it hard to put across the effect it, they've had on you. But you'll also lie awake, awake at night, wondering how you can escape it, whether that's leaving your job, making arrangements never to be in that person's company, or voicing your complaints in a way which you know might reap the whirlwind. On this day, I wear purple, the colour of feminism, and stand with all women who've ever felt abused, diminished, controlled by persistent, insidious workplace harassment. Because I was one of you, and even as many as 25 years on from my harassment, I still think about what I could have done to stop it and how hard it was to take any action. And I salute those who in the last year were braver than me and who have. Now, I can get on to talking about my project. Uh, Claudia Beamish has already said that history is written by the winners, but I actually think it's more accurate to say history is written by the patriarchy. And some of the proof of that is on our high streets. You look up and there's a statue of a general, a king, a male writer, a male poet, a Glasgow traffic cone does not sit upon the head of a bronzed hair bun of a suffragette, it sits upon a short back and sides of a military man. There are simply not enough landmarks to represent the women who made Scotland. And those that are there should be given more importance. That's why today I'm pleased to say that I'm playing a small part to help those many people who've dedicated their lives to giving Scotland's women the recognition they deserve by working with Visit Scotland and others to generate a tourist map of the existing landmarks of influential Scottish women. <clears throat> Excuse me. But also asking the public, including everyone here in this chamber, to get in touch with me to get more information on Scotland and women's history that they would like to see recognised who aren't already. And I thank Glasgow Women's Library who've already been in touch to help me with this project today. I'm sad to say that there's not one statue of a woman in my constituency. But in the neighbouring constituency of Banshire uh, and Buckingham Coast, there's Fisher Jessie, the beautiful statue of a Peterhead fish seller and her child. To me, she's a symbol of the juggling act, caring for a child by her side as she works, humping her basket of fish, her shawl across her shoulders, and representing the ordinary Northeast women who were the engine of a country. I was delighted to see that the statue of the hero of the Glasgow rent strikes, Mary Barber, and others she led, was unveiled today in Govan. But in our capital city, we have more statues of animals than of women, despite the existence of great Edinburgh women like Muriel Spark or Elsie Ingalls. And of course, my colleague Fiona Hislop was instrumental in getting a plaque to Sophia Jex Blake, the leader of the Edinburgh Seven, who, along with Isabel Thorne, Edith Petty, Matilda Chaplin, Helen Evans, Mary Anderson and Ed Emily Boval were, amongst, were the first uh, women to admit it, be admitted into a university in the UK. They were stalked and harassed by male students and a mob of 200 rioted outside Surgeons Hall when the women arrived for an exam. The university ultimately refused to grant them degrees, but in 1899, after the efforts of the Edinburgh Seven, an act of parliament sanctioned degrees for women. I'd also like to put on record uh, my support for the campaign in Ayrshire that my friend Ruth Maguire is involved with to get a monument to recognise the many women victimised by the Scottish witch trials. I think that's a part of women's history in Scotland that's seriously overlooked. And in my own constituency, because I always mention my own constituency, we could do with more recognition of Strickland's own Lorna Doon, who was a novelist and Holyrood screenwriter at the cinema industry's infancy. Um, and I'd like to think that Lorna Doon uh, was behind the sort of people like Francis Madornan who stood up and made the speech that he did that was referenced uh, there earlier. I'd also be delighted to see suffragette Caroline Phillips recognised. These are women who didn't do things to be commemorated with plaques and statues, but they changed our world and they should be recognised. Dr Alison McCall, the convener of Women's History Scotland, said women's underrepresentation in the civic landscape has been partly due to the way these women viewed themselves. She says, a lot of the women we would want to honour are women who saw a problem and set about solving it. They didn't donate their diaries to an archive because they were never thinking of their own personal glorification. But glorify we must because they inspire others and even out women's represent re evening out women's representation is just another part of the jigsaw that will address women's inequality.
call Alison Johnson to be followed by Sandra White. The presiding officer. So here we are, International Women's Day 2018, and as Christina McKelvey and others have noted, the World Economic Forum's 2017 Global Gender Gap Report tells us that gender parity is still over 200 years away. So it's absolutely right then that this year's theme is pressed for progress, as women have waited far too long already, haven't we just? This International Women's Day, we're asked to commit to specifically concentrate on five specific actions to press for progress for gender parity in our own sphere of influence. And on that sphere of influence, I'm proud to be involved in Women 5050. I believe it's a good example of using the reach we as parliamentarians have to demonstrate our commitment to gender parity. And to all who are listening to this debate, if you haven't yet joined us, then please do. Um, but more on those specific actions. We're, call we're called at this International Women's Day to maintain a gender parity mindset. Well, if such a mindset was adopted, welfare reform wouldn't be aimed almost exclusively at women, as if they were a target for cuts. On a more positive note, the Scottish Women's Budget Group, I believe, are that gender parity mindset in action. We're called upon, too, to challenge stereotypes and bias, and I welcome the light that is being shone on some of the darkest corners of this bias through campaigns like Me Too. And we're called on to influence others' beliefs and actions. Again, Women 5050 is working hard to explain why lack of women in representative politics in our boardrooms, on our public bodies, matters. I want people to ask when they're watching FMQs or following proceedings in our town halls, why are there so few women in here? Where are they? And I would say to anyone sitting in the gallery, the chamber doesn't normally have this particular gender balance. We know girls are doing well in school and young women are excelling in our universities. So why are they not here in greater numbers, helping shape the laws that shape our country? We're asked too to forge positive visibility of women. That is something we can do and we do do. Thank you, colleagues. And finally, we're asked to celebrate women's achievements. And I believe that we need to get much, much better at doing that because celebrating those achievements will help us achieve those other four asks. Now, I'm delighted on this International Women's Day to celebrate, firstly, some very recent achievements. At last week's World Athletics Indoor Championships, the British team won seven medals. They won medals in seven events, but they won 10 medals in all because the women's 4x4 team won bronze. So women won nine of the 10 medals, and four of those nine medals were hard won by the incredible efforts of Scotland's Laura Muir, who won silver and bronze over two events, and Ailey Doyle, who won her first global individual medal with bronze in the 400 metres, and our own Zoe Clark in that 4x4 team I mentioned. Now, these women are incredible role models. Laura won't be competing in the Commonwealth Games. It's just about to, uh, you, you know, we'll be watching that very soon. But she won't be competing because she's completing her veterinary degree. And Ailey Doyle, who recently spoke at Scottish Athletics event in this parliament, she's a qualified PE teacher and her positive influence has been recognised with her inclusion in the Young Women's Movement Scotland list of 30 inspiring women under 30. And I'm proud to report that that inspirational list includes the first Green Councillor in the East End of Glasgow, Councillor Kim Long. Now, Councillor Kim rises to a challenge, like all the other women we celebrate today. And she tells us that, as a teenager, I really hated PE, but I went on to play hockey for Scotland. She was the moderator of the National Youth Assembly, and she pushed for young people's voices to be embedded in decision-making processes. She became the first ever young person to be on a special commission, the Special Commission on Same-Sex Relationships and Ministry, and you can read of her many achievements, but she says that my personal highlight was when I got a bunch of men in Bar Linney to sing in three-part harmony. Um, she regards that as one of her standout achievements. She says too, I want to see girls and young women taking up space, whether that's physically or vocally, in boardrooms, sports pitches, stages and classrooms, really wherever they want to be, but taking up space. We need collective empowerment, as colleagues have recognised, but it's also about 
realising that some people will face even greater challenges because of the structures we live in. Um, as Claudia Beamish said, history is indeed written by the winners, and Kim was at the unveiling of the statue of Mary Barber in Glasgow today. It's obviously long overdue, and if the gender gap is bad, the gender statue gap highlights how we have been really, really poor. We've not been good, to put it mildly, at celebrating women's achievements. Now, I'm the Deputy Convener of the Cross Party Group on Animal Welfare. I am passionate about animals. I am very pleased that we have a statue of a bear and a dog in this wonderful city. Um, but we can do much better when it comes to gender representation. If that's the way we want to continue to mark people and their achievements. Um, another young woman on that 30 under 30 list is the writer Kirsty Strickland. She's won awards for her writing on violence against women and she's judged on, the, on this subject too. She too speaks about the need for women to be confident enough to take up space. Kirsty says, I've struggled with imposter syndrome in the past, wasted far too much time wondering about whether I'm good enough or clever enough or brave enough to do the things I want to do in life. For young women, your time is precious. Please don't waste a second of it worrying that you aren't good enough. You are. So take up space, make yourself heard, know your worth and go out and achieve your potential. And know that while you're doing that, other women are rooting you on and delighted to see you succeeding. Now, a young woman who's not on that list, but I think deserves a special mention. I mean, that's only a list of 30. We know there are thousands, tens of thousands of, of young women who should be on that list. But I think Catherine Gemmell of the Marine Conservation Society um, has done fabulous work when it comes to the reduction of plastics in Scotland through her enthusiasm and her passion. And I know many of you in this building will have met her. Um, finally, presiding officer, if I may, this is International Women's Day, and I'd like to draw attention to the work of the Kenyan activist and a personal hero, heroine of mine, Wangari Matai. Now, she died in 2011, and I didn't know much about her, but the Kenyan Scott community in Edinburgh invited me to plant trees in Figgit Park, just a couple of miles from here. With them, she was the founder of the Greenbelt Movement, and they've now planted more than 51 million trees in Kenya, conserving the environment, providing employment for women, reducing poverty. And she said, it's the little things citizens do. That's what will make the difference. My little thing is planting trees. Presiding officer, let our little thing be a refusal to accept the status quo, to challenge it in all we do, to work together until women in Scotland and across the globe have our long overdue equality. Thank you. I call Sandra White to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you much, President Officer. And if I could just uh, reply to Alison Johnson, this little thing will certainly uh, not let it rest in, in certain aspects. And having uh, been born and brought up in Govan, uh, I listened to my granny and my aunties, etc. Incredibly proud uh, that we have that statue at last. <clears throat> As been said before, there's so many, many fantastic women, and really we should. Be, you know, honouring them, and I, I absolutely congratulate everyone who has spoken uh, previously. <coughs> Excuse me, and I think they've done a fantastic job. And uh, as, as the women, uh, past and present, are doing also. I want to just quote from the motion. I think it's really important that, that we we do that. And the, the one part I want to quote is that the Parliament unites on International Women's Day to reaffirm its commitment to upholding and protecting the rights of women and girls which are fundamental human rights, fundamental human rights. I think that's something we should repeat constantly. Imagine having to say that, fundamental human rights, because it affects women and girls. <clears throat> so I think that should be repeated constantly. There's many, many women that I could talk about from my past, from Margaret Ewing to various other political figures. But I want to talk about uh, a number of areas in my constituency. I'm just getting used to these glasses. I'm going to take them off now, actually. <laughs> They're really annoying me. And uh, my sight seems to have improved slightly at that particular point. I want to talk about the fantastic work that's going on in, in my constituency. And uh, one of the first ones, it was a young girl who came to see me who was a student and went from uh, success to success. <clears throat> and that is FEMENG. And uh, it's a network aimed at linking together females in the School of Engineering at the University of Glasgow. The group has a number of focuses, including outreach work with schools, networking events with industry professionals, social activity and international collaboration. Uh, FEMEN was started as, as a subgroup uh, within the Glasgow University Engineering Society 
by a young girl called, a young lady called Ellen Simmons, who came into my constituency office in Argyle Street in Glasgow to tell me about this fantastic project. She was just so enthused with it and her ideas, and uh, we just took it from there and met with the, the, the other uh, students there. Now, the network really did go and has went from strength to strength since in, you know, 2015 when it was first uh, announced. And in 2016, Femen became formally affiliated with the Women's Engineering Society and established a fantastic collaborative relationship with the society ever since. Uh, since the early days, one of their aims has been to take their message into the wider community around Glasgow and beyond. Uh, they've found that pupils are often unaware of the vast ranges of disciplines which can be studied in higher education and sometimes struggle to see how their skills could be applied to the engineering industry. And that's where FEMENG really are very successful. They offer informative presentations about the different engineering disciplines, what life is like as a student, advice for pupils about to apply to university, and they have really strong links with colleges and deliver campus tours and presentations for visiting groups. They don't necessarily mentor, but they certainly support uh, women who want to get in, young, young women in that particular, who want to get into engineering. Uh, they believe that one of the main deterrents for females studying or considering to study engineering, there is a lack of positive role models within the industry, and that's where Ellen and uh, her uh, friends and her fellow students come into it. Now, they aim to bridge the gap between the university student and the industry professionals. Give students an idea of where that degree can take them and one of the ways in which they do so is by hosting informal networking events which they call Future You. And at these events they invite successful female industry professionals, alumni, they give a brief presentation answering various questions about how did you get to where you are now uh, and basically building up the confidence of uh, the young uh, engineering students. In 2016 I thought this was an absolutely fantastic idea and it has been very successful. The group successfully pioneered FEMENG in Rwanda. Uh, the university's first student-led learning project in collaboration with the University of Rwanda. And if people want, you know, you think back at the genocide in Rwanda, there was lots of uh, men killed, obviously. So basically, there was very many women there and not as many men. So they had did this in Rwanda, and they initially brought together female engineering students, university with common goal of encouraging more high school girls in Rwanda to pursue a further education in STEM. And it's went from strength to strength, and I do wish them all the success for the future. Another girl I wanted to mention who is studying at uh, Glasgow University, has been mentioned by Alison Johnson, was Laura Muir. Uh, you know, she to date has won seven medals, including two gold medals, her most recent victories at World Indoor Championship in Birmingham, where she won silver and bronze. And she also won the Sport Award and the Inspiring City Awards last year, collaboration of People Make Glasgow, the Herald and the Glasgow Chamber of Commerce. And she is a fantastic role model, as already been said, for young people. I don't, am I going to ample time okay, if you lovely, if you feel you. obliged to take Mr Doris yeah I'm absolutely happy to. well I'm delighted that you have done because I would like to mention that another remarkable lady had the opportunity to meet the other day Sylvia Douglas who runs the organization the social enterprise Ms Ms Mrs based in Benview Street just between both our constituencies and that organization works to capacity build and empower uh, women in my constituency and across North Glasgow, particularly focusing in deprived communities. And I thought this would be a good opportunity to put on record the great work that they do. And I hope there are similar uh, organisations across the country that can do similar work, particularly in deprived communities. It's all right, you make up your time for that intervention. Ms. Uh, th thank you, thank you very much. I thank uh, Bob Doris for that and perhaps look forward to doing a joint visit with the, the group as well because it's absolutely fantastic to do that. Now, I can't uh, finish this without mentioning the Glasgow Girls, uh, as already been mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary. Now, myself and I know Tracy McKelvey was involved from the very, very beginning. And I think we do have to uh, mention and pay tribute to Ewan Girvin, who was the head teacher at Drum Chapel High, who basically got these girls together, gave them such a fantastic amount of uh, uh, courage to go forward. And, and we know the story of the, the various, you know, what happened about the dawn rays and how they were absolutely fantastic in, in, in what they did, particularly the seven young 
uh, women about the high rate of the poor treatment of asylum seekers. But if I can perhaps go on just a wee bit further uh, in regards to what happened to some of the asylum, uh, well, the Glasgow girls, Amal and Rosa, I still meet with them socially. I still go in demos, as you might call it, with them as well. They're still very much involved in social justice. In fact, Rosa went on to study politics at Strathclyde University, law and politics at Strathclyde University, and indeed Rosa as well stood as an SNP candidate in the, the last local uh, council elections. They came very, very close to winning. And I think that just shows you the, the courage that these young girls had. And it, it makes up the whole thing about basically we, women should support women. And they're certainly the Glasgow girls, Amal and Rose in particular, who, as I say, I still know, uh, are just um, you know, a beacon uh, for what women can actually do when they get the encouragement. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you, Ms. White. I call Alec Cole Hamilton to follow by Claire Hockey. Mr. Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak in this important debate and indeed uh, for the consensus around the government's motion today. My life has been filled with the impact of extraordinary women. Their impression on my world has been profound and I want to focus on one in particular in my remarks today. In April 1940, my great aunt Joan worked as foreign office intelligence in the British legation to Oslo. She stood side by side with celebrated spy chief Frank Foley, burning intercepts and manifests as Wehrmacht divisions overran that city. A key member of the Foley group, she then helped to rescue the Norwegian government and king and escaped overland by car and by foot through the snow, through Lillehammer and onto the coast. From there, after providing vital communication support to Norwegian resistance, she was evacuated by submarine to Britain and was awarded an MBE in the New Year's Honours list that year for her service. She was only 23 years old. I wish I'd known her. In her short career, she was present at some of the most defining moments in global history. She was part of the delegation to Yalta. I can only imagine the diplomat she would have gone on to become had she not been sadly lost to us when her plane disappeared over the Atlantic on her return journey from the San Francisco Conference, which established the United Nations at the end of the war. When I think about Aunt Joan, I am reminded of the frontiers that she had to push back on as a young woman in a man's world, that in the male dominated landscape of military intelligence. She was decorated and mentioned in dispatches several times. It's testimony to the strength of her character and her resilience. I see that strength in the woman in my life today and I honor them for it. Presiding officer, in the year that has passed since we last marked this occasion, it has been my great privilege to stand shoulder to shoulder with the Scottish government and indeed members of all parties in support of the changes we've delivered in advancing uh, women's rights and gender equality in landmark domestic violence legislation in the gender representation on public boards act and in the widespread condemnation of the rape clause but we still have frontiers on which to push back and in the year to come i hope we can do more to challenge employers who still engage in maternity discrimination clothing demands in the workplace or the gender pay gap which is measured out as nearly seven percent across this country and i was uh, very glad to be involved in the UCU protest outside at lunchtime, which among other things, was still talking about the disparity of equal pay in the university and college sector. And I want to see the advances we are making in gender representation on public boards mirrored in the boardrooms of private companies as well. And I want to see a shift in the imbalance that exists between the fact that whilst 50% of graduates in this country are female, only one fifth of UK companies are either led or owned by women. And let this also be the year when we can finally see a modicum of justice for those women born in the 1950s who are the victims of state pension inequality. Well, I am a feminist, but if I'm honest, I don't think that's always been true. My mother had been in the vanguard of the North American feminist movement in the 1960s, and it always brought me up with an understanding of respect and of equality. But when I think back on it, I spent so many of my formative years blissfully unaware of the privilege that I enjoyed as a boy and as a young man, in the stereotypes I conformed to and in the advantage I accepted without question. I was often a happy beneficiary of the patriarchy. 
And to my shame, I was at times a passive witness to things like everyday sexism, systemic injustice, and even the harassment so eloquently described by Gillian Martin a few moments ago. I'm not sure when it was that I actually woke up to this, but wake up I did. And over the past 20 years, I've strived to be both a better man and a better feminist, to live up to the example set to me by people like my mother, my aunt, my sisters, and all of the female role models in my life. I have mentored female candidates within my party, helped to steward all women shortlists through its structures, and I've worked for gender balance in the Liberal Democrats to the point where, as director of our national campaign at the snap general election, I helped to reverse an imbalance which has existed since the inception of my party when we returned a group of Scottish MPs to Westminster, half of whom were female. But it does not stop there. In every debate such as this, I rise with a not insignificant degree of embarrassment at the reality that I speak for a group made up of parliamentarians that are exclusively male. So I offer this commitment. I will do everything in my power to ensure that the next group of Liberal Democrat parliamentarians return to this place, be it big or small, will look more like the society we seek to represent and less like the Liberal front bench of 1916. International Women's Day affords us the opportunity to reaffirm that shared commitment to gender equality, to take stock of the mountains that we still have to climb in pursuit of that aim, and to recognize that attitudes and complicity, such as those of my younger self, can be turned around. We will hear the words of many great women in today's debate, but I want to leave you with those of a man, Indian movie star Amitav Bachachan, who, like me, woke up to the iniquities of patriarchy that had benefited him so richly. He said, because you are women, people will force their thinking on you, their boundaries on you. They will tell you how to dress and how to behave, who you can meet and where you can go. Don't live in the shadows of people's judg judgment. Make your own choices in the light of your own wisdom. Now, I see the spirit and strength of my Aunt Joan and the many great women I'm proud to share this chamber with in those words. And with that, presiding officer, I commend the motion to this chamber. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole Hamilton. I now call Claire Hockey to be followed by Morris Corey. Ms. Hockey, please. Thank you, presiding officer. International Women's Day is just as important now as ever, and I'm sure this year's Awareness Day will help progress the cause for true gender equality. Presiding officer, when I look around us in this chamber today, I am so proud to see many strong women beside me. My female colleagues across political divides show each and every day that politics is now very much the business of women. However, looking back at UK political representation throughout history, it's staggering that since 1918, only 489 women have been elected as members of the House of Commons. To put this into context, until December 2016, there had been fewer women MPs ever than there were men elected to the House of Commons at any one time. We sit in a parliament that's composition is now 35% female, and while this demonstrates that things are moving in the right direction, we are still far from reaching gender parity. People look to our parliament as an example. Therefore, I look forward to its future when it better reflects Scotland's wider society. Presiding officer, women of my age and younger have been afforded greater opportunities in their lives than our predecessors, be that in education, in the workplace or elsewhere. And this is thanks to the generations of women and men who before us advocated and fought for gender equality and parity of opportunity. In his message marking International Women's Day two years ago, former Secretary General to the UN, Ban Ki-moon, said that as a society, we have shattered so many glass ceilings, we've created a carpet of shards. Now we are sweeping away the assumptions and the bias of the past so women can advance across new frontiers. As an MSP, I see it as my role and indeed my duty to continue to fight the fight of our mothers and grandmothers before us and address current inequalities for the benefit of women and girls in the future. Society may be fairer and more equal now than ever before. However, the progress has not moved swiftly enough and women still face a number of injustices today. As my colleague Gillian Martin so movingly spoke about, we continue to be subjected to sexism and sexual harassment. As Alison Johnson mentioned, we are adversely affected by welfare reforms and we still continue to face massive barriers at work. 
notwithstanding pregnancy and maternity discrimination, sexual harassment in the workplace, or the fact that women are more than three times as likely to be working part-time. When women do work, they are often paid less than men. Last year was the year of the BBC gender pay gap controversy, which revealed stark differences in salaries of public figures. However, this is not an issue which is unique to the media or the celebrity world. The gender pay gap impacts upon almost every workforce across the UK. Presiding officer, more women than ever before are working in professional high-ranking jobs, but what use is it when their pay is often less than their equivalent male counterparts? According to research by Opportunity Now campaign, in the UK, for every pound a man earns, a woman takes home 81 pence. As a committed trade unionist myself, and I duly uh, refer members to my register of interest and in that I'm a member of Unison, it continues to be a real source of personal frustration that women continue to lose out in the workplace. Since 1997, the gender pay gap in Scotland has narrowed considerably from 26.5% to 16.1% in 2017. However, 16.1% is 16.1% too many. An Ipsos Mori poll recently conducted asked respondents when they thought that pay and economic equality would be achieved. The average answer of the participants was the year 2035. Members will not be surprised to hear that 2035 is a bit on the optimistic side, with the World Economic Forum suggesting that at the current rate, women are likely, are likely to reach economic parity with men in 2,234. And I doubt very much I'll be about to see that. <laughs> there are many drivers of the gender pay gap. However, sadly, not one particular solution to closing it. As with many of the injustices women face, some barriers are systematic and cultural and will sadly take generations to unravel. However, many of the proactive measures taken by the Scottish Government will go some way in making Scotland more equal for our young women in the future. For example, through the recent changes to the Equality Act 2010, an amendment to that legislation now forces public authorities to report their gender pay gap and publish equal pay statements if employing more than 20 people, which is down from 150 employees previously. Furthermore, through the implementation of the Developing the Young Workforce Scotland's Youth Employment Strategy, it will address gender imbalances in young people's careers, choices and opportunities. And also by continuing to push employees, employers to become living wage accredited. It's not right that over 100,000 more women than men earn less than the living wage in Scotland. However, the government have ensured that Scotland already has the highest proportion of employees paid the living wage of any country in the UK. Presiding Officer, International Women's Day should act as a renewed impetus for us all. We must continue to work together to close gender inequality, not only for ourselves, but for the generations to follow. Today, just over 100 years on, women not having the right to vote is now viewed as a ludicrous idea, old-fashioned history. I look forward to the day when gender inequality is seen as something that would happen in the olden days, as my kids would say an outdated concept which is consigned to the history books. As the motion alludes to, this is Scotland's year of the young people. So we owe it to them to do all that we can to create a fairer and more equal society. As evidenced in the other speeches today, focusing on the Me Too and the Time's Up movements, we are hopefully witnessing profound changes in our world. And for the most part, women are leading the way. Thank you very much, Ms Hawkey. I call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Rona Mackay. Mr Corrie, please. Thank you, Deputy Signing Officer. Well, I, I fully agree with Claire Hockey's uh, comments about that we are surrounded by strong women here today. I'm lucky enough to have the same at home with my wife and three daughters. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak today as we celebrate women and girls around the world on International Women's Day. Whilst it is a day for celebrating the accomplishments and progress that, we've, that have been made, it is also a day for recognising the progress still left to be made. Globally, the female population continues to face inequality and injustices in nearly all aspects of life, from health and education to career opportunities to domestic, to domestic abuse. Issues of inequality in the workplace, lack of political representation, gender biases and sexual harassment continue to persist in society. 
and we have certainly come a long way over the last 40 years from when I worked in the cotton mills in Paisley, where women mill workers were not allowed to wear trousers. Also, if they became engaged to be married, they had to leave the company. Gosh, what an improvement today. Campaigns like Me Too movement and Time's Up, which have been mentioned, have added momentum to the push for equality which women deserve. Women are feeling more empowered to speak about their experiences with inequality. We must take this opportunity to listen to women and girls to try and understand the injustices they face and find solutions to achieve equality. We all know that there are areas of Scottish society where we must improve. In education and training here in Scotland, there has been a 47% decline in the number of women enrolled in college in Scotland, whilst the fall, fall amongst men over the same time period has been only 25%. Only 5% of those starting STEM apprenticeships in 2016-17 in were female. In the political world, women make up 50% of the population. However, they only make up 35% of MSPs and 24% of local councillors. Now, we, the Scottish Conservatives, have recognised that this is an area that we ourselves need to improve in. And that is why last year my colleague Annie Wells launched the Women to Win Scotland campaign where women in the Conservative Party can receive the campaign training, network and financial support they need to run a successful campaign. More recently in the last week, we have also launched a new diversity commission under the direction of Baroness Mubarak, MEP, to increase the number of women and minority candidates running under the Conservative banner for seats in the next Parliament. Now, over the last 10 years or more, in the armed forces, we have seen more women taking up frontline operational roles in, on land, sea, and in the air. And further, we're seeing more senior command roles being achieved as well. And this is only to be commended. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm going to move on to a slightly different topic, that of the, women, the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians, or CWP, which was set up in the late 1980s. It is a network of women's members of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association's parliaments and legislatures. The CWP, as it's called, is an, as an integral part of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, or CPA, is working for better representation for women in legislatures and also for the furtherance of gender equality across the Commonwealth. The CWP network provides a means of building the capacity of women elected to parliament to to be more effective in their roles, improving the awareness and ability of all parliamentarians, male and female, and encouraging them to include a general perspective, a gender perspective in all aspects of their role in legislation, oversight and representation, and helping overseas governments and Commonwealth governments to achieve and become gender sensitive institutions. Now, the Scotland branch chaired the first meeting of the British Islands and Mediterranean Region CWP Steering Committee in September 2013 and held the first regional CWP conference in March 2014. Now, my colleague, Mark Mitchell, is a CPA Scotland branch representative on the CWP Regional Steering Committee. The CWP recognised that traditionally women have been the main drivers of change in, on gender equality. However, whilst women are by far the strongest advocates of general equality, all parliamentarians and parliaments as institutions also have a role, and the CWP appealed to branches within the CPA to appoint male champions. So that is why the CWP requested that CPA branches should nominate a male parliamentarian to act as CWP male champion, and I recently volunteered for that role with the strong encouragement of my wife and my daughters to be truthful. Uh, this initiative is in its infancy, however, I am looking forward to developing this role in the future for this Parliament and working with other members from all sides of this chamber in that role and also other CWP male champions in the region and elsewhere. And in fact, as I was coming to the debate this afternoon, I was told, in fact, that I understand that this Parliament is the first Parliament in the European Union to appoint a CWT male champion. This year's theme for International Women's Day is the Press for Progress, and I understand everyone to do that and urge them to do so. Press for progress in education, encourage women to go to college and to pursue careers in STEM, press for progress in the workplace and to close the wage gap and to end stigmas that suggest women cannot hold executive positions. Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, we need to press for progress in government, empower women to run for office and listen to their ideas and experience that will be able to bring about real productive change and in creating equality for women. 
It is the experience of women that need to be at the forefront of this equality movement, and therefore they need to be present and active in the forums in which change will be enacted. And while International Women's Day is only a single day in the year, the sentiment lasts year round, and we must continue to make progress in achieving equality for all. And I wish you all a happy International Women's Day today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corey. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Ms Mackay, please. Thanks, Mr. Presiding Officer. I'm absolutely delighted to speak in this debate on International Women's Day to talk about inspirational and amazing women who have shaped our society and contributed so much. As we've heard from all sides of the Chamber today, we've come a long way since the days when the suffragettes and suffragists fought so hard and sacrificed so much to win the right to vote. Something we all now take for granted, and even my generation can't believe it was once denied to us. But today, along with talented and world-renowned women, I'd like to give credit to the inspirational women who don't make a name for themselves with their inventions or their heroic deeds. And we've heard a lot about those women from, from other colleagues in their speeches. Um, presiding officer, inspirational women are all around us in our everyday lives. For me, my gran and my mother were amazing influences in how I grew up, which I know is not unusual. Their values and unconditional love gave me the security and values from which I benefit to this day. However, as we know, not all children have the good fortune to grow up with inspirational role models in their lives. And that's why the more we learn about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, the more we can help people live happier lives. Presiding officer, for several years I wrote a feature called Forgotten Heroes for a magazine highlighting the amazing contributions largely overlooked Scots had made to the world throughout the centuries. However, I had to dig long and hard to find profiles of Scottish heroines, of which I knew there were many. This has sadly been the case until recently. Women were virtually airbrushed from history. Women like Elsie Ingalls, founder of the Scottish Women's Hospitals, Heirs Marion Gray, a mathematician who influenced the telecom giants of today, Geolog geologist Marion Gordon from Aberdeen, zoologist Muriel Robertson. I could go on, presiding officer, but time won't allow, and my colleagues Gail Ross and Gillian Ma uh, Martin mentioned a lot more. Thankfully, this anomaly is changing. And it's, been, it's great to hear about Gillian's, uh, Gillian Martin's excellent project. A few weeks ago, I visited a school to record a video with pupils aged around 12 to 14 to talk about inspirational women. They're also holding an event tomorrow to celebrate International Women's Day, which I'll be attending. I was asked by one boy who my inspirational women were. After I'd mentioned family and certain politicians, I said Rosa Parks, the first lady of civil rights, who refused to give up her seat to a white passenger on a bus in Alabama 1955. I honestly didn't think they would have heard of her, but to my delight, they all nodded and said they were doing a project on her at that time. The next question I was asked was, if I could bring back either suffragette Emily Davidson or Jane Haining, who saved thousands of Jews during the Holocaust, who would it be? An impossible question. I told them I honestly couldn't choose because each had contributed so much, but it was fabulous that they knew about these wonderful women. So where are we today? Well, we're getting there, but there's still a long way to go in our fight for equality. So it's entirely fitting that a statue of Mary Barber has been unveiled today in Glasgow. As we heard, she led thousands of women through the streets of Govan to fight for fair rents during the 1915 rent strike and campaigned for women's access to reproductive and sexual health, a social pioneer and inspirational woman in the truest sense. Presiding officer, today the Scottish Government has a proud record of promoting women's equality, such as ensuring greater pay transparency, increasing early learning and childcare provision to record levels, and working with the Equality and Human Rights Commission to challenge pregnancy and maternity discrimination. We're also setting ambitious targets to increase the gender minority share in the most imbalanced college subject, subject groups and modern apprenticeship frameworks, improving women's representation on boards throughout the introduction, through the introduction of the Gender Representation and Public Boards Bill and the Women 5050 campaign and other initiatives. And so today we fight on to banish the gender pay gap, gain equal access to the boardroom and finalise equal pay claims. We fight on for an end to sexual harassment and bullying at work. We fight on for an end to violence against women. We fight on for our rights to LGB LGBT women and for free sanitary products and much, much more. Presiding officer, these things should not have to be fought for. They are our rights. And in 2018, gender equality and respect should be a given. 
so we will not give up until that is achieved. So today I'd like to celebrate all women, mums, grands, aunts, sisters, carers, women who are an inspiration to someone, somewhere. And to the many amazing women who work in the third sector, such as Dr. Marcia Scott of Scottish Women's Aid, Karen McCluskey, Chief Executive of Community Justice Scotland, who have done and continue to do such crucial work in protecting and improving the lives of women. And there are many, many more women in the third sector who, who really deserve a, a shout out. We should celebrate how far we've come, but know that there is much more to do so that our daughters and granddaughters are shown the respect and best possible future that they deserve. Then our work and that of our pioneering sisters will be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Kate Forbes. Miss Ballantyne, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Throughout my life, I have been inspired by a number of influential women who have each helped to change the world in their own way. And as I look back at some of these women in the run-up today, it became very clear that women have been defying the odds successfully and unapologetically for centuries. Mm -hmm. Today in Scotland, we as women no longer face the barriers that we did, even 50 years ago, and we undoubtedly have fewer odds stacked against us. There are, of course, still challenges and barriers here and across the world where women are objectified, abused or oppressed, such as some of those highlighted across the chamber today. However, in this country, we now have a generation of young girls who can see strong, independent, successful women as normal. Gwendolyn Brooks, Pulitzer Prize-winning author, poet and teacher, taught me that sometimes you have to tell people things that they do not want to hear. As she put it, truth-tellers are not always palatable. Presiding officer, we have spent the last century successfully working to redress the gender balance in this country, and I welcome that. But we must be equally careful that we don't press too far. An article in the Times this week raised a very pertinent issue which resonated strongly with me. Should we really be worried that more boys go into engineering and more girls go on to be nurses? I believe the answer is yes, only if there are barriers preventing them from doing differently. It is the barriers that we must address. I have a son who is a tree surgeon. I have a son who is a soldier. I have a son who is an engineer and a son who is an economist. I have a daughter who is a primary teacher and a young daughter who tells me she wants to get married and have children. <laughs> Did I fail as a parent for not push pushing them to break the gender stereotypes? I don't believe so. Eleanor Roosevelt declared, do what you feel in your heart to be right, for you'll be criticised anyway. You'll be damned if you do and damned if you don't. By all means, we should encourage young girls to find their passion and ensure that whatever it may be, she can achieve it. However, we must also be careful not to push too far. If a young girl wants to keep house and be a mum, then we should respect and applaud that choice too. Girls in Scotland are now 56% more likely to apply for university than their male counterparts. And perhaps I hope the Cabinet Secretary would like to congratulate with me, Glasgow Medical School, who tweeted today that in 1933, 16% of their graduates were female. But in 2017, 71% of their graduates were female. That, by any standard, is a phenomenal change and phenomenal progress for women. Now, of course, I welcome the drive for girls to achieve academically, but I do worry sometimes that we are no longer pursuing gender parity in this country, and instead the promotion of women's rights is in danger of coming to mean the demotion of men. We have a responsibility to all our children and all our young people to be strong role models, whether male or female, and encourage them to strive to achieve all they can, irrespective of gender. Women in Scotland have more freedom than ever to determine their own futures, and we should absolutely celebrate that. However, on International Women's Day... Yes? Mm -hmm. Emma Harper. Thank you. Um, I um, just would like to ask Michelle Ballantyne if she would agree that the launch of the Women in Agriculture Task Force last June at the Royal Highland Show is a great way to highlight that Joyce Campbell and Fergus Ewan are heading that, and it's a great way to highlight the important contribution women make in agriculture. 
Michelle Ballantyne. Absolutely. And I think, you know, during the wars when, when um, women went onto the land as farm girls and proved yeah. that they could do the job equally to men, yeah. that was the beginning of an enormous change for women. Yeah. And, and as I said, I want to see women uh, able to do whatever they want to do. It's the barriers we take down and all the actions we take should be about removing the barriers and allowing girls and boys to compete equally for whatever job they wish to do. I, I'd, I'd just like to continue for a bit, but you can come back in a bit. Um, however, I, what I want to say is that on International Women's Day, we must turn our focus to the women who remain second-class citizens. And the theme this year is press for progress for them. There are horrific cases of violence against women, abuse and persecution based on gender, which are still too common across the world. Often those most at risk are also those who are already marginalized. And this is therefore issues beyond gender, which we should also be addressing. In a number of cultures, the education and health of women is deemed as inconsequential. And when I first trained in London, many of our patients that came in, their husbands spoke for them and the women were not allowed to have a voice, not even allowed to speak our language to talk about the issues they had. Often they are degraded further than that by the violence and abuse they receive. And therefore it seemed radical in the 1960s when King Faisal of Saudi Arabia introduced public education for girls. Yet in just a few years, even the most traditional Saudis were sending their daughters to school. New norms can be established and new norms must be established. Religion and culture are often major factors preventing the establishment of women's rights. However, in an age of interconnectivity, where the majority of the population has immediate access to international events and ideas, it will be more and more difficult to stand in the way of a global shift towards equality. Just last year in Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman changed several laws to grant women more freedoms, freedoms which in most countries we would take for granted. But it was an acknowledgement that holding on to the ultra-traditionalist culture was, in his words, not normal. This is a small step, but it is evidence of a large-scale systematic shift occurring globally. Press for progress will not topple kingdoms of countries who reject the equality of women. However, it can help to add pressure and move to establish a global norm of gender parity. With each country that acknowledges gender equality, we come a small step closer to a global community where men and women are equal. There will come a time when it is no longer in the interests of a leader to deny gender equality, especially as men and women come to stand together on this issue. Michelle Obama made the point in her New Hampshire speech, which resonated around the globe, that strong men, men who are truly role models, and Alex Cole Hamilton perhaps made this point very strongly, don't need to put down women to make themselves powerful. The more the idea of equality spreads, the more difficult it will become to refute. Movements such as the Time's Up campaign have helped to fuel an international Can I just stop you there, because your time's up? Right. Okay. I'm enjoying the speech, but I'm sorry. You've had seven minutes, four minutes, 40 okay. seconds. Thank you. Uh, can I call now Kate Forbes to be followed by Anna Sarwar. Ms Forbes, please. Thank you, Presiding, presiding Officer. Of course, it's right to celebrate milestones in the past on International Women's Day. But I'm going to use my speech to talk about the continuing violence against women across the world. And I'm hosting an event this evening on gender justice. In the first two months of 2018 alone, I've heard story after story of sexual harassment, of domestic abuse, of trafficking and of prostitution. All of these are just symptoms of the same problem, which is objectifying and demeaning women to facilitate violence, abuse and harassment. The stories are deeply unsettling, as are the statistics. Globally, almost 40% of all murders of women are committed by male partners. And in Scotland, just over half of the female victims of homicides were killed by their partner or ex-partner. Telling these stories on a day like today is so important 
because until there is widespread acceptance of the problem, nothing will change and there will never be an anniversary commemorating that change. We don't want to be advocates forever. We want to celebrate change. The same is true of trafficking of girls and women within Scotland and to Scotland. Many, though not all, are trafficked to work as prostitutes without the power to walk away and at the mercy of people who will use and abuse them as commercial property. These are unsettling matters, but they are painstakingly true and they are not just restricted to the big cities. A few days ago, it was reported that figures of suspected human trafficking in Scotland had shown a marked increase in 2017. Trafficking does not just affect people from other countries and can take place in every community, and that includes each of our communities, no matter how rural they are or off the beaten track. One of the busiest slave trafficking routes anywhere in the world is the trafficking of girls from Nepal to India for forced prostitution. An estimated 100,000 to 200,000 trafficked Nepali people are in India. Each of them have a face, a name and a home. Every year about 10,000 Nepali women and girls are trafficked to India and attempts to traffic many more are made as well. And yet only 350 cases of trafficking were actually registered with the police. I'll say those figures again. Every year, about 10,000 Nepali women are trafficked and only 350 cases are actually reported. A few weeks ago, I visited Nepal to see some of the, see some of the anti trafficking work through the Children at Risk Network, which raises awareness amongst communities, empowers women and girls with skills and opportunities, and tries to improve the economic status of households which would otherwise be vulnerable to offers of trafficking. I met high school girls in a rural village, all of whom were attending computing and tailoring classes so that they could earn a living and contribute to the household income. They were bright girls, as earnest and as giggly as teenage girls in Scotland, but they and their peers face the very grave risks of trafficking and have no choice over the matter. After the earthquake in 2015, the numbers of trafficked women rose significantly because of the increase in poverty. Selling a woman is currently today in communities in Nepal a means of feeding a family and they are sold by brothers, by fathers and by husbands. Some are saved. Deepika is a 17 year old girl who was taken by her brother to the passport office to apply for a passport. The authorities had a few doubts about her reasons for applying because when she was asked where she was going and why, she didn't know. After a number of other questions, the authorities discovered that the man wasn't actually her brother. He was there just to send her abroad. He swiftly disappeared and Deepika was supported to go home after being counselled on the risks of trafficking and sexual exploitation. She was under the impression that she was to be given a job in India that would contribute to household income. Not everybody is saved before it's too late. Last week, International Justice Mission, which was the subject of a member's debate by Gillian Martin last year, helped police to bust a trafficking network in India based in a hotel where girls and young women were being sold for sex through a secretive trafficking network who were making thousands from their abuse. Of the six victims, two were children. Almost 20% of victims in private trafficking networks are children are young girls. Last year in the same city, four women were rescued. The youngest was 13 years old. They had been moved around constantly, being sold for sex in homes and apartments. And there are thousands more today, as we hold this debate, who are still in grotty hell holes, bought and sold by anybody with the cash, and obviously, particularly vulnerable because they are women and they are at the mercy of the men in their lives who will buy and sell them in order to feed other family members. Those women need our voices to shame, to shame the inaction by the authorities, to support the efforts of charities like IJM and Tear Fund, and to pray and hope for the day when women across the world are free of that kind of abuse. As a woman, it is my right 
It is my right that I should not be subjected to violence, to domestic abuse, to rape, to sexual assault, to commercial sexual exploitation or to honour-based violence. And until all women can claim that right, not just in Scotland, but in every community of every country, there is a lot of work to do. Thank you very much, Ms. Forbes. I call Anna Sarwar, who is the last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. Can I start by saying I'm proud to stand in solidarity uh, with all the sisters today on International Women's Day and say from the outset that I am proud to call myself a feminist. And directly to men, it makes you no less a man to be a feminist. It makes you no less a man to recognise that gender inequality exists. It makes you no less a man to recognise and celebrate International Women's Day and it makes you no less a man to accept that everyday sexism is real, exists and impacts on women in workplaces, campuses, playgrounds and elsewhere, not just here, but right around the world. And we owe a duty to all sisters and all women right across the world to accept that, recognise and campaign side by side with them on this important agenda. Because we can't leave any community to fight their battles on their own. Because for all of us that believe in equality in all its forms, this is a shared fight for each and every single one of us. We can't leave women to be the voices fighting for gender equality. Just like we can't leave LGBT communities being the one to fight for LGBT rights. Just like we can't be the ones for asking ethnic minority communities to fight for against racism. We can't leave Jewish communities to fight anti-Semitism alone. We can't leave Muslim communities to fight Islamophobia alone. Instead, all of us together, shoulder to shoulder, must take on these shared challenges so we can defeat prejudice, hate, inequality in all its forms and root it out of our society. Um, others have mentioned the historical context of today. I'm proud that today in Glasgow, for example, we unveiled the Mary Barber statue. Mary Barber, the first uh, woman to be elected uh, in the city, a woman who did so much to help so many, not just women, but people right across her community fighting against uh, the rent caps, sorry, the rent, and fighting for rent uh, controls. Now, I'm often asked uh, by people, I'm sure every politician is always often asked by people, who inspired you to come into politics? Uh, who are your role models? Um, and people are often surprised when I say that my role model is actually my mother. I think people naturally expect me to say uh, my father. They expect me to say I get my politics from my father. In fact, I get my politics from my mother. I get my values from my mother. Um, and the reason why is because she is an individual who has never stood for political office, never sought political office, but has faced up to racism and fascism throughout her life since arriving here as a four-year-old, but then also as the wife of someone who was trying to be elected as Britain's first Muslim MP. But she's done it with a solidity and a bravery that has been inspiring, not just to me, but to countless other peoples as well. But she hasn't stopped there. My mum now lives in Pakistan with my father. She's not there just being the wife of another politician somewhere else. She actually leads on an international project uh, to, for women's empowerment uh, on social uh, enterprise. Uh, she runs 42 social enterprise units, helping to create employment for young women, particularly from the most deprived communities. Uh, she helps operate two hospitals that give free treatment to the poorest and most vulnerable women. Uh, one of the hospitals specializing in maternity care so they can reduce the number of uh, stillbirths and give support to women. Uh, and she also uh, supports a school, so she helps run a school to guarantee education for local uh, girls. Uh, she's an inspiration uh, to me, um, and I know she's not watching today because she's in uh, Pakistan, but I want to send her uh, a message of love uh, and solidarity on International Women's Day, and I'll make sure I remember to send her a Mother's Day message on Sunday um, too. Uh, I've touched upon the global challenges. Uh, the reality is for far too many women, uh, we fail to recognise they have no access to democracy still in so many parts of the world. For too many girls, they still don't have access to basic education. The right to go to school is still not a fight that we have won in the world. For some in this world, they still believe that education is something for boys and not for girls. That's something that we've still got to fight in our world today. That right to access basic healthcare. We have rightly talked about ending period poverty here in Scotland, but actually for so many women right around the world, even access 
to basic health care is not something that they have. Employment, still employment barriers right around the world. To think some countries only allowed women to start driving in the last year alone, access to employment and the employment market. The redistribution of wealth, how wealth is owned by people, not just in this country, but around the world, about the percentage of women that own property, that own land, that own business, that actually help to grow their economies. And I recall when I was a shadow international development minister in, in a different parliament, that one of the most successful projects that I saw was actually the microfinance projects that were happening in some of the most developed world, developing countries and the poorest countries in the world that were being led by women. And when I spoke to those women and those families, I asked, why, why do you think that, that microfinance is coming into the hands of women rather than to the men in your society? And the answer one back was, was two answers back. One, because it's a recognition that we have a voice and a role to play too. But secondly, if you, if you invest in a woman, we'll make sure the community benefits. We can't guarantee that'll happen if you invest in the men in the community. And I think that's very, that's very, very, very true. They weren't meaning that as a joke, and I didn't take it as a joke. It very much is true about women having that responsibility, not just to themselves, but actually to the wider society. And I actually reflect on something that my grandfather used to always say. Um, he was never very keen on sending my, or particularly keen on where, my, where my, his sons went to university or what they studied. In actual fact, one of his sons dropped out of university. Uh, he, he made not a bad career of it himself, but uh, dropped out of university. But he put most focus in my aunt, his daughter, going to university, studying to be a doctor, and actually serving in our National Health Service here in Scotland as a general practitioner. And I remember asking him once about, why, why are you so focused on your daughter's education and you didn't care about your son's education? And he said, the reason is, if you educate a man, you benefit one person. If you educate a woman, you benefit a family. That's, that's a fundamental principle that I think needs to be shared around the world. Um, I want to just say in closing, because I realize I've taken up probably more of my time, is the everyday sexism campaign that has uh, gripped quite lightly the media in the last six months or more and issues of sexual harassment have, I hope, woken up people to the realities that women face every single day. And I would challenge any man, any man, right in, the, in this country, right around the world, if they haven't reflected on that campaign and thought about their own behavior in everyday situations and what that might have meant and the impact that might have had on women around them. I know I've reflected on my behavior and I would hope every, every man reflects on their behavior so we can give fairness, equality and justice to every woman. We've made progress, but my God, we've got a lot more progress to do and I stand shoulder to shoulder with sisters in that project. Thank you. I was hesitant to interrupt you there when you were doing so well, but we have a little, just a little few minutes in hand, so I can give you a generous six minutes, Ms. Lennon, when you sum up for Labour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome the chance to close the debate today on behalf of Scottish Labour and to speak in favour of the amendment to the motion by my colleague Rhoda Grant. There is indeed much we can celebrate about ongoing work to address women's inequality in Scotland. But as well as an opportunity for celebration, International Women's Day for me is also an opportunity for women to organise and to highlight the work which still needs to be done. The government's motion today acknowledges its ongoing commitment and activity to tackle women's inequality. And I commend Angela Constance for the leadership that she shows as Cabinet Secretary with responsibility for equalities. And I think today's debate, um, I was trying to think of a word, I think maybe magical, Sandra White's eyesight improved in the middle of her speech. So I think something special has happened here today. But, <laughs> but I think there's been... Um, I think there's been an emotional connection actually across the chamber because although we sit in different parties and have different views on, on some issues, a lot of the issues we've discussed today really resonate and either affect us directly or people that we care about. And I'm, I'm really grateful to everyone's contribution so far. Um, we have reflected in the debate on the achievements which we've made here in Scotland over the past few years. The passing of historic legislation in the form of the Domestic Abuse Bill, the Gender Representation on Public Boards Bill and the criminalisation of revenge porn. These are significant legislative leaps forward which strengthen women's rights in Scotland. And I commend activists and parliamentarians alike who have been responsible for achieving these significant wins for women's equality. These victories are evidence of what can be achieved when women and, more importantly, feminists and feminist women are elected into positions of power. 
It's evidence of why I, like many others across this chamber, remain restless and impatient for further and faster progress on women's political representation. Because we know that key to achieving change in so many of these issues lies in ensuring that decision-making bodies are reflective of the society they seek to represent. And I'm grateful to Alison Johnson and others who are part of the Women 50 Collective, and that really has made a difference. When reflecting on today's debate, the progress that we've made so far and the progress we've yet to achieve, it struck me that there are so, only so many times that we can repeat the same arguments, the same statistics and the same debates over and over again. The statistics around women's representation have been rehashed so many times in this chamber and by myself alone on more than one occasion, and I've not been here this long, that women, especially women of colour, are underrepresented in our national parliament. In fact, there's never been a woman of colour in this parliament. Our media, our public boards and in our councils is an unacceptable truth. So why does it matter? It matters because we are still living in a society where violence against women is all too common. Where one in three women who work even in this place, presiding officer, in this building, can say that they have experienced sexist behaviour, sexual harassment, and we, we've read that in the recent um, survey that was published just last week. And most of us aren't surprised at all by these findings. It matters because we still live in a society where only a fraction of reported rapes are even prosecuted, and even a smaller fraction of those results in a conviction. And Claudia Beamish, who I think has had to, to leave the chamber, but she is right, when, when the media reports on these crimes, it's not about sex, it's violence against women, and it's about the abuse of power. And there's been some great speeches, I can't mention them all, I think I've already tweeted that Gail Ross was, was outstanding, but Gillian Martin, Gillian Martin, you, you made me cry because these issues are very, very real. And I don't want any woman to come into this workplace and feel unsafe. I don't want that for any woman in any part of Scotland or indeed beyond. So the spirit of Labour's amendment today is to highlight the theme of this year's International Women's Day, Press for Progress. And to me, it feels like this year we're starting to see on the back of the, the momentum from the Me Too and the Time's Up movement that maybe people are going to wake up and we are going to see some real change. Just last night, uh, a, a well-known woman in politics, Mary Black, was telling it as it is in goods on Mary Black, reading out violent, offensive, frightening abuse that is sent to her in a public forum. So why shouldn't she say it in a public place, uh, particularly in, in our parliament? Why should women in politics keep quiet about this? On Twitter, I discovered that I was described as the human equivalent of an anthrax-soaked razor wire tampon. How dare we as women fight to combat period poverty? But I have been undeterred and I've worked with women across this chamber, including Gillian Martin, Victoria Heaney from Women for Indy. We are not going to shut up and be silent on this issue. So I'm pleased today to mark International Women's Day that I've lodged a final proposal on my member's bill to establish legal rights, which would give everyone who menstruates in Scotland the right to access free sanitary products. And if we can get this right in Scotland, we've heard a lot today about women's, um, the injustice against women globally, we can get this right and help affect change across the world. So I know that, that my time is almost up, presiding officer. Um, yes, there is a lot that we can celebrate on International Women's Day, but there is still so much more that we have to do. Um, it feels like in the chamber today, the spirit of, of Mary Barber and her army is, is with us. Rosa Grant says we want to be respected. Gail Ross said that lip service won't do. Uh, Rona Mackay said we will not give up. And Anna Sadwar and Alex Cole Hamels are just some of the men who have made their commitment to our cause too. So that just leads me to say happy International Women's Day to all of you. Thank you very much, Ms Lennon. I call on Alison Harrison to close for the Conservatives. A generous eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted this afternoon to continue the consensus that has been the hallmark of this debate. As we celebrate over 100 years of International Women's Day, I feel a deep sense of pride to look around this chamber and take in the success of so many women, as was also noted by Claire Hawkey. 
While today is, of course, a day for celebrating our achievements, it is our, our obligation to ensure that we do not become complacent and instead push ahead to make even greater strides in the next 100 years to guarantee the true equality and empowerment of women. We have heard excellent contributions from across the Chamber. From the opening speech made by Angela Constance, who spoke about equality for women and girls and what actually matters to our children today, and I feel that here is a cause that surely few people could disagree with. A parliament united in support to protect and uphold the rights of women and girls in this Scotland year of young people. And acknowledging the role played by organisations such as Girl Guiding Scotland, Young Scot and the YWCA Scotland, to name but a few organisations. These voluntary groups play their part in helping girls realise their potential and build their confidence to prove that not only are they every bit as good as men, but help them strive to surpass them and become leaders in their fields, whether it's business, science, arts, professions, or of course, politics. In 2018, it is unbelievable that there is an ongoing need for women to push every day for causes such as closing the gender pay gap, encouraging more women into public life and standing up for women who suffer from harassment and abuse to continue to call out everyday sexism. Very recently, as we will have seen at the Golden Globes a few months ago, all eyes were on the red carpet as actors wore all black in a show of solidarity with victims of sexual harassment. Rhoda Grant this afternoon spoke passionately about the devastating effects of domestic abuse. There are obviously still barriers to overcome, and yes, glass ceilings still need to be broken. However, from the red carpet down to each and every female in 2018, we all want to see progress being made, and it is becoming more apparent that women are definitely uniting and becoming active for women's equality, which is being aided by social media campaigns such as Me Too and Time's Up. I would like to honour the Press for Progress campaign mentioned earlier by Christina McKelvey and others. This is uniting women all over the world in the pursuit of gender equality. This movement aims to challenge stereotypes, celebrate women's achievements and lobby for greater gender parity, which if no immediate action and concerted effort is made to include women at all levels of the economy, Gender pay parity will not be achieved for another 200 years, as we've already heard from Alison Johnson and others today. Quite incredible. A recent report from the World Economic Forum found a direct link between gender parity and the success of an economy. This illustrates that closing the gender pay gap is not only good for women, but good for society as a whole. This message is one that we need to promote in this chamber and in our communities because women's rights matter to all of us. On a positive and indeed pertinent note, the WEF data also shows that when women are more present and participating in leadership roles, more women are hired right across the board at all levels. This detail holds true even when taking into consideration the disparities in the size of female talent pools across various industry sectors. Different political parties may have different ideas on how to close the gap in representation that exists, but we all acknowledge that elected office is an area in which women continue to be underrepresented. We can differ on how we get there, but not on the need to see more women standing for elected roles, whether for councils or for Scottish and UK parliaments. Last year, my, my party launched Women to Win, which aims to promote the brightest and best women in the party. And I would like to acknowledge the role that Annie Wells and others have played in pushing forward the agenda for Women to Win Scotland. And we heard earlier from Maurice Corey about the launch of the new commission within my party. As part of the Scottish Government's programme of themed years, 2018 is the year of young people. It is good that young people are being celebrated and this year of young people gives young girls the opportunity to celebrate their achievements and their contribution to communities, whilst also giving them the opportunity to shine locally, nationally and globally, as recognised in this motion today. Deputy Presiding Officer, we have heard from my colleague Margaret Mitchell, who has spoken about women's attainment in the legal profession and others who have spoken about STEM subjects. I agree that much progress has been made, but I also agree that there is still much work needed to be done. 
It is true that over the past few years, the number of passes by girls in STEM subjects at school has increased not only in higher qualifications in maths and computing, but also in higher qualifications in chemistry and physics. Nevertheless, I believe that in the chamber this afternoon, we all recognise that gender stereotyping is still discouraging girls from taking STEM subjects at school and aspiring to STEM careers. And I strongly believe that in our recognition of this fact, this is the first step towards correcting this and in going forward, seeing, seeing the numbers steadily increase for girls, not only at school, but going forward into college and university. Presiding officer, sorry, deputy presiding officer, <laughs> many good points have been made from, I know that is promotion, from across the chamber this afternoon. And I recognise all the speakers in this debate who have made very valid and useful contributions. And to hear Anna Sarwar talk about his mum and how inspirational she was, well, I find that very touching as a mother. And I would like to hope that my son perhaps will speak <laughs> of me in even slightly glowing terms <laughs> going forward. So I'm excited to work with everyone in this chamber to advance real gender, gender equality, respect for women and the upliftment of women in politics. I appreciate the opportunity that International Women's Day has provided for discussing these important issues on this public platform and I welcome all input into solving them. Working together, we can realise the potential of women in Scotland and improve lives of all. Thank you. Thank you. I was just thinking Mr Sarwar's caused a lot of problems for my sons as well. Uh, I ask uh, Marie Todd to close with the government uh, minister till five o'clock, please. Thank you, presiding officer, and I'm delighted to have gained a little bit of extra time for my closing remarks, because as you can imagine, I have plenty to say on this topic. Given the focus this year on young women and girls, I'm absolutely delighted to be closing today's international women's debate. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to do this job and to have the opportunity almost every day to say to young women, if I can do it, you can do it. You can dream big, aim high and go for it. I'd like to thank all of the members who've contributed to this afternoon's debate. It's clear that across the chamber, we're united in achieving gender parity and we want to see action taken both here and abroad to ensure that women are tre treated equally and fairly in the workplace, in the home and in society. And it's clear that we all want for our future generations what we all want for our future generations. As we've heard, 2018 is Scotland's year of young people. And I'd like to highlight the uniqueness of this themed year in being the first to recognise people as one of Scotland's greatest assets. Scotland's the first country in the world that we know of to dedicate a full year to celebrating young people. And that's a unique opportunity to show our young people how valued they are and how proud Scotland is of all that they do and all that they can achieve in the future. This is a new innovative approach and it's only right to welcome the entire ethos of the year, which is, which is that it's been developed by young people for young people. Activities throughout the year will focus on celebrating the achievements, recognising the contribution of our young people and on what they do to contribute to communities all across Scotland. And in return, we need to ensure that we are creating opportunities for their voices to be heard and most importantly, for their voices to be listened to. Children and young people should be at the heart of decisions that affect them. That's their right as set out in Article 12 of the UNCRC. And now in the Children and, and Young People Scotland Act 2014, it's also central to the ethos of the Year of Young People. To ensure that, continuity throughout, that there is continuity throughout the year, a group of young people, Communicating, have also been recruited. Supported by Young Scott, their role is to champion the values of co-design and to ensure that young people's voice are, voices are heard and acted upon across activities for the year. We want to ensure that all of our young people feel and believe that they are valued, wanted and vital to our country's future. 
This government's committed to giving young people a stronger voice in policy making and co-designing improvements to service, services which affect their lives. And in doing so, by changing perceptions of young people and changing the country's relationship with our young people, it's our aspiration to create, create a lasting legacy beyond 2018. Now, I'll respond to some of the points that were raised in the, in, in, during the debate. Annie Wells, I would say to you on, on the gender pay gap, there is definitely no room for complacency. But the pay gap is narrower here in Scotland than in the rest of the UK, and we are taking decisive action where we have the powers. We also have a slightly higher female employment rate in Scotland than the rest of the UK. And I hardly need to mention the transformative potential of our expansion in early years, in uh, early learning and childcare, which will undoubtedly enable many more mothers to work. And because of our commitment to the living wage, the largely female workforce will all get a well-deserved pay rise. To Rhoda Grant, I would say, my colleague An Angela Constance um, already intervened um, to highlight uh, the issues around universal credit, a topic which I have spoken very passionately about, as you and I both represent an area where it's been um, already been trialled and been in, in practice for many years. And I would welcome all parties' support in tackling that devastating policy at source at Westminster. This, I would also say on the domestic abuse, the Scottish Government has committed already to providing additional funding specifically to train 14,000 extra um, uh, 14,000 officers and staff. This dedicated funding will enable Police Scotland to train officers and to, uh, staff to identify the new offence. And Scottish Women's Aid will also receive some funding to develop training to help communities to understand the legislation. Now, to Alec Cole Hamilton, and I would say in a very slightly teasing fashion, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but I don't want you to mansplain me. I'm not sure, but did I hear Alec Cole Hamilton offer to stand down at the next election to ensure that a woman can have his seat? Or, or perhaps, perhaps his words were intended for some of his colleagues, not for himself. <laughs> to Michelle Ballantyne, I would say, um, I'll, 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 I'll put back Christina McKelvey's words right back at you, as they say on social media. Men of quality should not fear equality. There's no, sh I would love to see the day when there's no such thing as boys jobs and girls jobs. I'm keen at the moment to attract young men and older men into careers in early years. We don't want to undervalue the work that women traditionally do, and we don't want to corral anyone into any job. Of course, people should be able to freely choose their path in life. But I do think, and you heard it with the murmurings around the chamber and the people trying to intervene, I do think you under-acknowledge the barriers that we face, not least the lack of role mo models, not least the culture and conditioning which led, I would say, someone like me, who was an absolute science geek as a youngster, who has hires in physics, maths, biology, and chemistry, to not once consider engineering as a career and to train as a health professional. A career which I did absolutely love, I have to say. Yes. Michelle Ballantyne. The point I made very strongly was that it's the barriers we need to address. It's not about gender, it's the barriers. Now, the barriers in your case, I don't know what they were, whether it was your teachers, your parents, whatever, but it was those barriers because you had the capability to do it and that's what's important and it's the barriers we need to address. Marie Todd. So again, I just reflect, I ask you to reflect on the murmurings that that's causing around the chamber. There's clearly um, something in what you're saying which is out of step with many other women in this chamber. I thoroughly enjoyed um, everybody, um, many women in the chamber raised and men, um, talked about some of the very, very strong and powerful women that we have um, seen in Scotland in our history, including Mary Barber, whose statue uh, was unveiled today. And I would just um, give a wee plea, I think um, both Gillian Martin and, and Rona um, 
it talks about uh, these historical women being written out of history. I would give a wee plea for the rioting women from all over the Highlands who um, were absolutely integral in resisting landowners' moves to clear them off the land. And, and I, I understand when I was growing up that it was the women of Koyach, just north of where I grew up, who um, not only stripped the sheriff officer who came to clear them off the land of the summonses that he had brought with him, but they also stripped him of his clothes and sent him packing in the boat he arrived in. So I look forward to seeing that commemorated um, on your Her Story um, project. I want to talk, move on to talk about um, sexual harassment and an issue that a number of people raised in the chamber. Sexual harassment or abuse of any form, whether in the workplace, in the home or in society, is completely reprehensible and must stop. Everyone has the right to live their life free of abuse, harassment and intimidation. And I encourage anyone who has experienced this to report it. We have to tackle the underlying attitudes and the inequalities and the culture that perpetuates this behaviour. All workplaces, whether within a political party or in any parliament, must have robust processes for reporting and dealing with harassment or bullying. These should be fair, sensitive and supportive to all of the parties involved. Harassment is not a problem specific to any one institution. It is the responsibility of all of us in society and for all of us as individuals to take action. Now, this could be a watershed moment where we could see real societal change in the treatment of women, but we need to seize that opportunity for change. And on this, I would say we heard an incredibly powerful contribution from Gillian Martin, who talked about the insidious, sustained, thinly veiled sexual comments that women suffer. And I would say with Gillian Martin, I also salute these women who were brave enough in the last year to speak, speak up and make a difference for all of us. And I commend to the chamber the poem Spartica, which I tweeted today by Pippa Little, and I'm going to quote directly from it. I am proud to stand together with all the other humourless bitches, and I quote, who don't tolerate banter either. I'll move on to sport. The Girl Guiding Survey, which a number of people talked about and which the Cabinet Secretary referred to, highlighted the positive impact of sport with girls, saying it helped them to be more healthy and feel more confident and positive. The Scottish Government is encouraging more women and girls to take up sport through our £300,000 Sporting Equality Fund. And we've established a women and girls sport advisory group to shape future action. And it was great to hear Alison Johnson talking about her, some of her sporting heroines. And I'm delighted that that advisory group has one of my sporting heroines, Dee Bradbury, who came from Alison Johnson's sport of athletics into my sport of rugby and is still forging a pioneering path by becoming the first ever female president of the SRU, first tier nation, tier one nation female president later this year. On early learning and childcare, our plan to nearly double funded early learning and childcare entitlement for all three and four year olds and some two year olds will make a vital contribution to our priorities to grow our economy, tackle inequality and close the attainment gap. Before I move to my concluding remarks, I'd like to thank all of the organisations who do a fantastic job supporting children and young people in Scotland in one way or another. YWCA Scotland, Girl Guiding Scotland, Young Scot, Children in Scotland, the Scottish Youth Parliament and the Children's Parliament to name a few. Thank you also to our delivery partners for the Year of Young People, in addition to those already mentioned, COSLA, Sport Scotland, Creative Scotland and Visit Scotland, and a special mention and thanks to Communicating, a group of young people who are co-designing the Year of Young People activity. Presiding Officer, one of my favourite writers is the Nigerian author of Half of a Yellow Sun and Americana, Americana Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And she said, gender as it functions today is a grave injustice. I'm angry. We should all be angry. Anger has a long history of bringing about positive change. 
but I'm also hopeful because I believe deeply in the ability of human beings to remake themselves for the better. This afternoon, we've acknowledged that 100 years after some women got the right to vote, though there's been considerable progress in women's rights, gender equality still eludes us. We've also reaffirmed our commitment to remaking our society for the better, to creating a more equal and fairer Scotland, one where young women and girls don't anticipate sexual harassment or being paid less than their male counterparts as inevitable. I do believe we'll get there. There's an energy at the moment. And I've met and spoken to too many of Scotland's young women and girls to think otherwise. Their message is very clear. Enough is enough. The time is now. And I'm going to finish with another quote by a very proud feminist, Barack Obama. Change will not come if we wait for some other person or if we wait for some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on International Women's Day. The next item of business is consideration of five Parliamentary Bureau motions. Can I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 10839 to 10842 on approval of SSIs and motion 10901 on committee meetings? Move together. Thank you very much. We come now to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 10851.1 in the name of Annie Wells, which seeks to amend Motion 10851 in the name of Angela Constance on International Women's Day, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 10851.2 in the name of Rhoda Grant, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Angela Constance, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 10851 in the name of Angela Constance as amended on International Women's Day be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And I'll put a single question on the five Parliamentary Bureau motions. Does anyone object? Good. Uh, the question is that motions 10839 to 10842 and 10901 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>